लाइट्स मॉर्निंग एवरीवन वी आर फ्यू मिनट्स लेट बट एनी वे आई अपोलॉजाइज फॉर दैट सो विल बी स्ट्रेट अवे गोइंग इन टू द सेशंस बिफोर दैट आई वांट टू इंट्रोड्यूस आवर बॉम्बे ऑर्थोपेडिक सोसाइटी प्रेसिडेंट डॉक्टर राजेश गांधी just a small felicitation and i also want to introduce our vice president who is actually the patron of this master series which runs throughout the year uh, on different topics where we have uh, masters who speak on the same topics so i welcome dr satish mutha also as i said this is a uh, one of the flagship programs of bombay orthopedic society where we discuss these topics so uh, i want dr satish mutha to introduce the program to you before we start the actual session dr satish good morning friends Uh, let me first thank Dr. Sanjay Dhar and his team for taking so much efforts and chalking out such a crisp academic program. As you all may be aware, Master Series is one of the flagship events of Bombay Orthopedic Society, which is held once in two months, where there is an intensive discussion on some core topic by people who are established in that field. We are starting off this year's events by. this master series on elbow under the leadership of dr sanjay dhar uh, we hope the academic content will be of use to you all and you will enjoy this sunday morning spent with us thank you dr satish uh, so i once again welcome all the delegates as well as the faculty and uh, uh, to apprise you we have a very uh, huge uh, international faculty right now and most of them have joined in uh, we will introduce them as they we have dr inho jion from seoul uh, who is a very um, uh, big elbow surgeon who usually listen uh, joins our programs regularly and you will hear to his nice lecture as the day goes by we have dr li yu uh, from china Uh, who will also be speaking there right now live on with us and we have besides other uh, international faculty whom you will be uh, listening very soon so we proceed with the program itself uh, we have our first lecture is incidentally by dr satish mutha himself so he'll be speaking on coronoid fractures and proximal ulna fractures dr satish ये 
Good morning, friends, and uh, I'll be speaking on coronoid fractures. So, uh, coronoid process has received a lot of attention in the recent past as a major contributor to stability of the elbow. Throughout through this talk, I will be taking you through the role of coronoid in elbow biomechanics and stability, the common biomechan the common mechanisms of injury the classification of coronoid fractures and the treatment philosophy. Isolated fractures of the coronoid are extremely common, except rarely, you know, in hyperextension injuries, you may get a small flake fracture. Otherwise, majority of the coronoid fractures are associated with radial head or the proximal ulna with or without the collateral ligament injuries. And whenever you see such a case, you must analyze the injury in total. You must take, the, take into consideration the effect of that fracture on the overall stability of the elbow joint, the, the pattern of injury, the likely mechanism of injury, and the possible associated structures that, have, that, have been, that might have been injured. Uh, you all know about this, the anatomy of the proximal ulna. The three most important things here that we should know is that the, proxim, the coronoid process is a major anterior restraint to posterior dislocation in the elbow. There is a sublime tubercle medially, which is attachment of the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament, which is a major medial stabilizer. You have brachialis tendon, which is attached about two centimeters distal to the coronoid. And the lateral portion and the lateral portion forms a major contributor to the sigmoid notch where the radial head articulates. This is a cadaveric uh, specimen. You can see the attachment of the brachialis, which is about 18 to 20 millimeters distal to the coronoid. The sublime tubercle where the anterior bundle of the medial collateral attaches, which is a fairly long attachment. And then you have the posterior and the transverse bundle, which are ill-defined and their contribution is not clear. So if you look at the overall stability of the elbow, the major contributors, you have the primary and the secondary stabilizers. So the primary stabilizers is the ulnohumeral joint, the anterior bundle of the medial collateral ligament, and the lateral or the radial collateral ligament. And then you have the secondary stabilizers, which is the radiohumeral joint, the common flexor mass, and the common extensor tendon. Now, uh, trying to understand the contribution of coronoid, coronoid is the cornerstone of the ulnohumeral articulation. Along with the olecranon process, it forms a guiding ridge where the trochlea articulates into the upper, upper ulna. It, it's a major restraint in posterior translation and dislocation in flexion. The anteromedial portion of the olecranon is a major uh, stabilizer for you know, uh, medial instability. And the coronoid, in addition to the olecranon, with the muscles in the back, that is the triceps, and the muscles in the front, which is the brachialis, they all hold the ulna into the trochlear notch. Now the commonest mechanism of injury that we all know of is the terrible triad, which is when you fall on a flexed elbow in a fully supinated arm, there is actual compression. The olecranon goes behind, breaking the coronoid, and then you may get a radial head neck fracture with lateral collateral injury and an elbow dislocation. The second mode which is receiving more attention nowadays is the varus postromedial instability, which occurs due to a varus force at the elbow. Because of varus, there is an impaction injury of the anteromedial facet and the lateral collateral ligament may give away. 
then you have the more rare varieties where you have the olecranon fracture with the coronoid fracture and the whole elbow dislocates posteriorly which is basically type a posterior montagia injury and you may have a anterior or a trans olecranon fracture where the the entire radial head and the olecranon with the coronoid process moves anteriorly with the olecranon fracture the last two are pretty uncommon injuries they can be really devastating injuries and require urgent attention so the earliest classification that we know of is the regan and mori classification which classifies the coronoid fractures into three types one is the avulsion of the tip or the flake fracture which is less than 2 mm second is fracture of less than 50% of the coronoid and the third is fracture of more than 50% of the coronoid and each of them has subtype a and b uh if there is an elbow dislocation associated or not this uh, this classification was conceptualized based on you know contribution of the coronoid to the physical stability of the elbow so they described they thought that more the coronoid is fractured more the unstable the instability at the elbow but few things were overlooked in this is the oblique injury patterns and uh, combined patterns so later on two more types were added that is the lateral oblique which is uh, denoted by the green line and the lateral side and the medial oblique which is mainly the anteromedial facet subsequently it has been classified by old riskel from the mayo clinic which is the commonest one which we all use now it has type 1 which is again a very small flake fracture the type 1 is a tip fracture which is subtype 1 and 2 one is the flake second is a slightly bigger piece then you have type 2 which is the anteromedial facet uh, which extends distally into the sublime tubercle there are three subtypes the second one may be associated with the tip and the third one may be associated with the sublime tubercle and then you have the coronoid body and base fractures and transalnar basal fractures which are type 3 injuries now what are the roles what is the philosophy of treatment how do you manage these cases the treatment goal in any elbow injury is to congruous reduction and a stable elbow if if you compare it to the like a tibial condyle a depressed fracture our main aim is to restore the articular congruity because that is very important there it may lead to early onset arthritis your anatomic congruity is important but not so important more important here is to you know uh, restore the stability of the elbow so that you know minor anatomical variations incongruities will not have any significant impact so when you get a fracture with a dislocation your first step is to reduce the elbow once you reduce the elbow take good x rays more important is the lateral view today of course you can do a ct scan on almost every patient and on the x ray and the ct you have to assess the congruity of the reduction so what is a congruent or a good reduction and a stable reduction a stable reduction is one in which the elbow does not dislocate between 30 degrees of extension to 130 degree flexion it may be unstable in terminal extension or flexion but that can settle down with healing and what is a concentric reduction we all know the concentric reduction means where the radial head lines up with the capitulum and the ulnar joint is concentric with the trochlea so you should be able to define these four lines on a good lateral view the trochlear sulcus the outer ridges of the capitulum and the trochlea which are green here and the trochlear notch in the ulna here you can see it appears benign you see the x ray without the plaster the radial head is subluxed the distance between the trochlea and olecranon is increased so this is not a concentric reduction you need to have a good quality x ray you should supervise it yourself if required now is there any role for non operative management of coronoid fractures yes the type 1 fractures are usually a flake less than 2 mm they are usually inside the joint intracapsular 
once you reduce them and if there are no associated major ligamentous or radial injuries they are stable and they can be treated conservatively unfortunately many of them are part of the plri or the terrible triad complex and the treatment is dictated by the associated injuries so type 1 fractures would rarely involve the capsule because the capsule inserts about 6 mm distal to the tip and therefore type 1 fractures would not really involve capsular avulsion the other important structure that is the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament inserts about 18 mm distal to the tip so even type 2 fractures most of them will not involve them but the type 3 fractures or the basal fractures can often involve the sublime tubercle making it a very unstable situation so you should know the anatomy and the landmarks to decide the consequences of the fracture type 2 more where you have about 50% or less they may cause marginal instability here the major decision depends on the associated in injury to the radial head or the neck if the radial head or neck is not majorly injured or minimally injured and displaced if the collaterals are fine then a type 2 may be left even with a little displacement and the results are sacris uh, satisfactory in the type 2 odriscal where you have the anteromedial facet which uh, we just described uh, some time back the anteromedial facet is actually an extension of the sublime tubercle and these fractures of the anteromedial facet very often would involve the sublime tubercle leading to medial laxity and therefore most of them would require surgical fixation type 3 are of course uh, significant chunks of bone they usually they are very rarely stand alone fractures would have significant associated injuries and almost always require surgery then the concomitant injuries or the associated injuries dictate the treatment in most of the cases if you have the varus posteromedial injury where you have the anteromedial facet and the lateral collateral ligament injured you have to fix both the pillars the terrible triad as we all know in except in a very few cases most of them will require surgical intervention the transalacrinal ones 100% require fixation very few situations of type 2 fracture where you get a concentric reduction and a stable range of movement as we discussed earlier may be treated conservatively this is a lateral oblique one which is receiving attention nowadays it is the lateral portion of the uh, coronoid facet which is part of the sigmoid notch although these fractures are not very unstable but if they are not anatomically reduced you may have pain in the a uh, rotation in the proximal radial ulnar joint like you have the dr uj pain you have the pr uj pain which is being described now surgical approaches of course there are variety of approaches the medial lateral posterior anteromedial it all depends on what are the associated injuries and what are the other things you need to tackle medial injury is medial approach again can be decided uh, based on the fracture pattern the workhorse is workhorse is going through a split in the fcu uh, the originally described hodgkiss approach which is anterior to the fcu you reflect the entire flexor pronator mass take the brachialis off the problem is it is not a very versatile and does not let you extend it too much hence the fcu splitting approach is commonly used the only problem here is the anterior branch of the ulna now has to be carefully uh, taken into consideration and then you have the posterior taylor scam approach which is the classical approach where you dissect the whole ulnar nerve and work between the ulnar and the fcu when you need to transpose the ulnar nerve this approach is very handy lateral approach you have two windows mainly the one anterior to the extensor mass which is the kaplan's interval and the one posterior to the extensor mass which is the cocker's interval kaplan is by far the most versatile it gives you good approach of the coronoid it lets you work on the coronoid even if you have a intact radial head and it is pretty extensive unlike the cockers which is limited exposure and you have to have a broken radial head to be uh, you know easily able to see the coronoid and very often if you need to go down you have to dissect the lcl out 
the only advantage with cockles is that you are far away from the posterior interosseous nerve and hence it's a little safer then you have the boyd's approach i'll not go into the details the anteromedial approach the various fixation techniques uh, depending on the size of the fragment the commonest is using screws or guide wires antegrade or retrograde retrograde screws have been shown to be biomechanically stronger in very thin fragments you may use threaded k wires with miss uh, wire technique you can use a acl guide for proper placement and nowadays people are doing arthroscopic fixation of the fragment also in larger uh, type 2 or type 3 fragments you may have specific uh, plates that have been designed for that purpose which can be used through a extensive medial approach you can use suture lassos or transolecranon sutures for comminuted fractures which you, which you cannot fix with the implant and very often after you've done all the fixations you find that the elbow is still a little unstable so it's not a bad idea to have a neutralizing x fix for some time till the soft tissue is healed complications of fixation after having fixed everything very often it will still remain a little unstable and as we discussed we may have to put an x fix o opening the elbow the always threat is there of heterotropic ossification and stiffness so you should ensure that you get a stable fixation so that you can mobilize as soon as possible pharmacotherapy we don't know much it will be discussed by our subsequent speakers and the ulna nerve is always uh, to be watched out for thank you Thank you, Dr. Satish. Once again, thank you, Dr. Satish, uh, for your insight into coronoid fractures. We move on to the next lecture, which is by Dr. Ashay Kekatpure. Dr. Ashay Kekatpure is a fellowship-trained elbow orthoscopy and reconstruction surgeon, and he's also an associate professor at NKP Salve Institute in Nagpur. Dr. Ashay, he will be speaking on radial head fractures. Dr. Ashay, are you there? Uh, very grateful on this wonderful Sunday morning. Thank you, Bombay Orthopedic Society, for this opportunity. Uh, we will be discussing today radial head fractures. So the debate between fixation processes and resection. So about 60% of the load across the elbow is transmitted through the radiocapitular joint. And for the radial head, it is a secondary stabilizer for vulgars after the anal collateral ligament injury and primary stabilizer for longitudinal stability with the interosseous membrane as a secondary stabilizer. So we need to really ask this question whenever we are uh, attempting to fix, uh, replace, or resect the radial head, that how do you see this radial head fracture and what exactly you are going to do, do about it, okay? There is huge amount of literature which is available. And uh, so we'll just cut through the maze and try to define our guiding principles or points to come at a uh, execution principle. 
So the objectives which we I'll try to cover in this is the anatomy, the elbow instability, the radial fracture classification and treatment, and an aspect about SX low plus the injuries. So as Dr. Satish sir has already covered, what are the uh, regarding the elbow stability? So we will just skip through this part. So static and dynamic ulnohumeral joint, radiohumeral joint, lateral ulnar collateral ligament, and the anterior bundle of the MCL. The dynamic stabilizers are the common flexor origin, common extensors origin, biceps, brachialis, and triceps. So fall and outstretch hand, the mechanism of injury is a little bit similar. Axial loading in the vulgus force, radial head and neck fractures occurs first along with the spectrum of elbow instability. Any treatment requires complete understanding of the injury and a CT scan along with the X-ray provides the valuable information to deal with the issue. So this is the complete spectrum. This is a simple dislocation at the left-hand side and the unstable elbow at the right-hand side, which is a constitution of the terrible triad also. So Mason has beautifully classified radial head fractures into type one, two, three. So type one is non-displaced fractures or minimally displaced fracture with less than two millimeters of uh, uh, bone fragment with no mechanical block to the forearm. These if they are not uh, having any cause of uh, block to the forearm uh, motion, then they can be conserved. Type two, it's angulated. They possibly block uh, the rotation and they need to be addressed and fixed. Type three, comminuted and displaced, and they obviously block the rotation. And type four, usually are associated with unstable elbow. It bridges the gap between more complex elbow instability, and we need to watch out for lateral and collateral ligament injury and type four injuries. So this is a algorithm which explains the amount of displacement, uh, the radial head fracture treatment, depending on the amount of displacements and whether the motion is limited or not. So if the fracture size is more than 25%, uh, if it is not more than 25% and displacement is uh, less than two millimeters and the rotation is not assisted, you can conserve. So first and foremost, we'll deal with a very regular topic, uh, a very regular uh, decision that if it is a comminuted or a slightly comminuted, so should we excise it? Isolated radial uh, stable, isolated radial head fracture, if the joint is stable, partial or complete recession can be a reliable option, but we need to look out for subtle instability, which is usually accompanied with a radial head fracture. And it may lead to posterolateral rotatory instability or radial shortening in long term. There is data coming up in which longitudinal instability when comp compromised leads to early OA of elbow joint. The radial head fracture without ulnohumeral or longitudinal instability, complete is, uh, recession is contraindicated. Partial recession may be a variable option and you need to be prepared whenever you are going ahead with a longitudinal instability with processes. Isolated radial head fracture. So this is a question we need to ask ourselves, does radial head fracture really occur in isolation? In type two and three, as you can see, uh, it has been pointed out by John it Itamura that more than 50% of the cases, they have got both ligaments which are injured. And in 80% of the cases, the lateral ulnar collateral is involved. So it is seldom that the radial head fracture occurs in isolation. We need to watch out for uh, collateral injuries. If you see, on a innocuous uh, uh, X-ray that you are seeing only a plain radio, uh, radial head fracture, please, please, please examine for the collaterals. You can do one thing is that you can take him to the OR, evaluate under CM evaluation, and if necessary, do a CT and MRI. So this is the Roman temple analogy, which is explained for the elbow and the role of the radius. So we need to ask ourselves whether we need to fix it whether we need to replace it and whether or we need to excise it. So when can we conserve, as already explained. So how to fix it? What are the anatomical considerations? So Dr. Satish has already covered regarding the approach aspect of fixation regarding the coronoid. So cocker is the most often utilized for radial head. It is the interval between the anconius and the ECU. Five centimeter incision from the lateral impicondyle distally, angled posteriorly 30 to 45 degrees, and often soft tissue will be disrupted in the radial head injury. Pitfalls, it damages the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. We need to stay on the anterior half of the radial head. There is a 
chance of damage to the pion so you need to be very careful whenever you are putting your human anteriorly you need to keep the arm pronated so that the nerve moves slightly distally and carefully dissect to the annular ligament capsule distal extension of the capsule becomes a thompson's approach it is more of a use for radial neck fracture proximal radial shaft fractures it is it utilizes the interval between the ecrb radial nerve and edc 10 cm incision from the lateral epicondyle towards the lister tubercle pitfalls is that it can injure the pion which is palpable between the two heads of the supinator the distal dissection can be utilized to locate the nerve so the pitfalls as as i explained that you need to be watchful for the pion if you are doing you need to be carefully you need to see it but the advantage is that the final approach if you are able to carefully dissect it out it gives significant exposure of the radial head neck and proximal shaft for more complex injuries less common approaches are edc and modified boyd it is roughly edc is roughly between cocker and kaplan the pros and cons are same as the other approaches so the anatomy of the pion when you pronate the nerve moves away slightly and it gives you advantage of dissecting or putting your plate or processes and gives you a good idea or good exposure for the neck so what we what should you do if the fracture size is more than 25% and the displacement is more than 2 mm then you need to go ahead and fix it now once it when it is an articular fracture anatomic reduction and compression is required you can either use a mini fragment screw or a headless compression screw there are various techniques such as the tripod technique in which you balance the radial head if it is a single fragment on the radial shaft like a bar stool and fix the uh, uh, head to the shaft using the headless compression screw in a tripod fashion implants <clears throat> a periarticular locking plate uh, with ao it is very useful but we need to watch out for the zone of application because care must be taken to keep it out of the proximal radial nerve joint because it will block the supination so the safe zone is 100 degree area between the tip of the radial solid and the lister tubercle if the fracture size is more than 25% displacement is more than 2 mm and three or more fragments are there then we need to go ahead with orthoplasty unfortunately in india uh, uh, the cost constraints and everything we have got only pressfit which is with bio uh, biotech and uh, Uh, the sharma the uma head which we use, usually use so the round uh, head options are round easier placement eccentric options are not available in india bipolar is also not there stem options are smooth loosely fitting you should avoid cementing the uh, radial head uh, stem in all cases because the removal in case you have to remove it it becomes very difficult the porous uh, the uh, biotech stem is available in a press fit fashion but it is all stem it is not porous coated and but it can cause result in dilatory remodeling cementing if you have to use a cemented radial head then it is for a salvage procedure whether you are not able to manage the offset so the thing which you need to watch out for is a radial head over stuffing radial head height typically is 0.9 proximal uh, 0.9 mm proximal to the lateral coronoid process only 2 mm of overstuffing will lead to 1 mm of ulno humeral gapping it is one of the most common complication especially in unstable elbow that allow for placement of a large implant and you are not able exactly able to close it the reason for most of the times uh, we end off or uh, many people end up doing overstuffing is that because the lateral part is open so there is no guide that how much amount of uh, uh, processes or the same height can go in, in in cases of comminuted radial head fracture as well as neck fractures so the uh, watchful landmark over there is the sigmoid notch or the radial notch direct uh, visualization will be the most accurate way to determine the appropriate size and the radial head should be just proximal to the radial notch of the ulna intrafluoroscopy will help but it needs to be done in flex uh, uh, elbow flexion and it is less reliable one thing which you can do is that whenever you are fixing or using your process uh, uh, you are using your template you can focus the cm on the druj and see the radial translation if the translation if you can see a translation in a live or a, uh, uh, on the cm for more than 2 or 3 mm then you have overstuffed 
another watchful landmark is that on a extended elbow if the lateral ulnohumeral joint is opening more than the medial ulnohumeral joint then that is a guide that you have overstuffed the elbow so these are the two things you should be watchful for radial head loosening of the stem occurs with press fit stem typically one week, one year within the surgery and there is a significant dilat uh, dilatory remodeling of the proximal ulna which can occur with press fit stem because of stress shielding outcomes <clears throat> mild mid to long term outcomes are good and excellent elbow stiffness is the most common complication with the over stiff uh, if the patient keeps on complaining of proximal uh, arm uh, forearm pain then that is a telltale sign that it is over stiff and you need to remove it loss of flexion or extension of stiff of approximately 10% which happens with radial head replacement and peri implant lucency is common but rarely requires revision we need to watch out for these sx low press inj injuries with radial head and neck fractures with intraosseous membrane disruption and druj disruption physical examination you, if you palpate the druj for tenderness and shucking of the joint it is critical the radiographs need to be critically evaluated to be sure of the entire film and contralateral films will help in diagnosing these injuries early because if you go ahead and uh, resect the radial head in sx sx low press thing then it is surely will land up in uh, arthritis so how do we need to treat it obtain contralateral films pin the druj versus repair of the tfcc orif or orthoplasty if you can manage orif very good or orthoplasty you need to have a radial head on the table and possible reconstruction of the intraosseous ligament if you can do it this is a paper which has beautifully uh, showed the effect of radial head excision on lone transmission in female athletes and they have uh, showed that uh, the variability or uh, it is difficult i mean uh, the joint reaction forces across the ulnohumeral joint increases and there is a early arthritis post op protocol for all stabilized fractures with dislocation regardless of fixation we need to immobilize for 10 to 14 days an early range of movement which allows dynamic stabilizers to help hold the reduction of the joint so to summarize we need to watch out for the lateral elbow ligaments and pin locations whenever you are operating make sure that you understand the elbow uh, injury do the necessary investigation in terms of ct scan and mri use a radial head classification understand when you need to fix it or resect it or implant it and sx low press look out have a look keep a look out for sx low press injuries thank you thank you dr ashay uh, we uh, we may actually we are short of time we have case discussion so i think that time we can have questions for the faculty so we move on to the next lecture uh, which is by dr parag munshi dr parag munshi my colleague from bombay hospital he is professor of orthopedics there and he is a well known upper limb surgeon so i invite dr parag munshi by the time we set this next presentation if you have any question dr ashay may be glad to answer any query <clears throat> you are talking about complex proximal radius fracture with or without involvement of the head and neck yeah okay 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 
see the uh, the kaplan approach i have as i have explained it can further progress it is an extensile approach okay so distally it can uh, evolve into the thomsons thomsons on the dorsal aspect okay so you can evolve it into the thomsons and you can resect it uh, or rather you can incise you can extend the incision as much as you want yes but you need to you need to be watch out for you need to carefully dissect out the supinator yes yes you need to see the nerve and regarding the question uh, that was the second part of the question also repair of the annular ligament per se but uh, if it is a complex injury the way you are saying it the lucl is mostly will be involved so annular ligament if you don't repair it's okay yeah my question is that now uh, in most of the radial head fractures when you are doing an arthroplasty the problem is that once you have put the radial head inside you are not able to see the pr uj so my question is that whether we require to change the approach whether we require to take a posterior approach lift up the anconius put the radial head so that we can see the pr uj bang on one more question intraoperative any tips for the avoiding pain like like as you said retraction and anything else what? you need to be very careful the way you use your hands usually what happens is that the person is holding the elbow and the assistant is holding the hand a very forceful uh, traction on the anterior aspect which loses the effect of the hand so try to avoid putting a common person to the hand to put it forcefully slowly i mean periodically relax it Okay, so morning everyone. Thank you, Dr. Dhar and the team here and the BOS for holding this uh, symposia and calling me here. Now, this is a very simple talk on the ulnar nerve, but it's very practical. For those who are going to be doing regular elbow work, you will take home a lot of important points. I must say, when I first uh, designed this talk, I said, look, let's call it the ulnar nerve, a closer look, so you know what you're looking at. But then they thought that let's make it friend and foe and see which camp we belong to. So... If you look at the history, it was Panis who first observed malunited fractures, then developing tardy nerve. Then came 1949, Maggie. He picked up neuritis across the elbow. And then again, the ulnar nerve faded away a bit into the background. Came 1957, 56, 57, Jeffrey Osborne. He described the band. And again, there was a renewed interest in looking at ulnar nerve pathologies. We failed to appreciate after carpal tunnel syndrome in the upper extremity, the second most common is your ulnar nerve neuropathy. So you need to be constantly aware of the incidence. All practical points, no theory. So why is ulnar nerve your friend? What is different in the ulnar nerve compared to the other nerves? One, it has a mesentery. When it has a mesentery, it means it has a rich intrinsic and an extrinsic blood supply. And therefore, you have that liberty of exposing ulnar nerve along its long axis and yet not devascularizing it or waking up and seeing that the patient has an ulnar nerve palsy. This is fine, but the most important part is that at every segment, there is a consistent intrinsic and an extrinsic blood supply, which is very peculiar compared to the other nerves. You look at common peroneal nerve, you've got large segments where you have only intrinsic nerve supply, and therefore there is no real vascularity coming through. A little bit of traction on the CPN and rest assured you'll get a palsy. So the first point is you are blessed with rich vascularity of the ulna nerve, which gives you that 
liberty to play with it. Now, where is the blood supply coming from? You've got to understand the anatomy of the nerve. So if you see how the nerve lies in its groove, essentially it is the posterior and the inferior segments which are feeding it, which means that when you transpose the ulnar nerve, look what you're doing. You're going to rip off all these vasculature when you take this in the front. It's not a bad surgery, but you have to be choosy when you're doing it. So you have the superior ulna collateral vessels, you have the inferior ulna, and then you have the posterior. There was a huge debate whether the posterior or the inferior was the main feeder, and it's the jury still out. But I think you need to protect both the vessels. Now, where to find the ulna? Now, often you'll get patients with bad fractures. They present late, the whole elbow swollen, heavy ecchymosis, bruising, and the whole thing is unstable. So by and large, if you look at the x-ray, you look at the top of the trochlea. And if you just drop a tangent along it, which means on the medial aspect, just where the medial epicondyle flare is matching the medial column, that is the easiest place to palpate it because the epitrochlear groove is just flattening and you literally feel a cord like your vast deferens just on the underbelly of the medial column. So if you're struggling where to look for it in a shattered fracture, don't struggle here. You need to go up 1.52 centimeters and just palpate for it right there. Now, once you've got a friend, you have to nurture the friendship, right? The same way, once you find the nerve, you've got to nurture it. When you isolate the nerve, this is not a very bright idea. You do not want direct high velocity traction on the nerves, although you've exposed it for a long segment. So the correct way, or perhaps a kinder way, is to loop it. In fact, now when I isolate the ulnar nerve, I take two loops. So you have one loop here, you have one knot, a second knot, and then you have the long uh, ropes. So even if you tug at it, or if your resident tugs at it, you've got two ports before you actually hit the nerve with the traction injury. So try to make sure you have a generous loop here, keep it nice and long. You can use a Penrose or you, you can rubber catheter or for that matter, even an eight number glove, just trim the periphery, snip it, and you've got a nice elastic cord through which you can take two knots. So handle with care. Now, what do you do when you have redo cases? Redo cases, particularly where you have poor note keeping from the primary index surgeon. So you've now got to go in, you don't know what's happened to the ulna nerve, or there'll be one line statement saying nerve anteriorly transposed, or for that matter, no mention at all. And how do you tackle such cases, particularly when you're converting trauma to a plastic? So the golden rule here is you must do a sonography. When you get these fat chubby patients, two, three surgeries done before, you can't really palpate the nerve. You don't know where it is. And as I said, if the note keeping has been poor, you're fishing in dark waters. So do a sonography and ask your ultrasound person that too, you need someone who's trained in mapping out the nerve to see where the nerve is and what is the position of the nerve when you flex and extend. And once you've got a fair measure where the nerve is, you'll have to go higher, more proximally, identify it where it's just piercing the intermuscular septum and coming into the medial compartment and then track the nerve all the way down. So redo cases, you have to be particularly mindful. So you've got a friend, you've developed the friendship, you've got to nurture it. So once the nerve is identified, you've got good control. Now you need to do a good decompression. So a common orthopedic surgeon or a general orthopod, when will he be tackling the ulna nerve? When he's got a fracture, TY elbow, the medial epicondyle, perhaps if he's doing pediatric fracture work or when you're doing straightforward cubital tunnel syndrome decompressions. So nerve compression, you need to be mindful of where the nerves can get compressed. So first and foremost, right up here, which is the arcade of Struthers or the ligament of Struthers. There was a huge debate, what you call it. John Struthers was an anatomist from Glasgow. And then he moved to Edinburgh and his passion was just dissecting the upper extremity, looking at condensations. And he's the one who has also developed or, or named the one where you have the, uh, the condensation for the medial nerve from the medial epicondyle and then the arcade for the ulna nerve. What is this arcade? Basically, it's just a loop of condensation which arises from the medial belly of the triceps, but it is consistent. If you look at all cadaveric dissections, it is always present. And if you see a Caucasian or a, or a Norwegian or, a, or an Englishman, you'll see it eight to nine. And I think for an Indian person, six to eight is a good landmark to have. So six to eight centimeters above the tip of the epicondyle, you must go identify your arcade or ligament or struthers 
And it's almost like an arch through which the nerve is coming out and you'll be able to divide it very comfortably like what you do for a carpal tunnel. The next spot. The next spot where it can get trapped is the intermuscular septum itself. So as the nerve, which starts from the cords upwards and comes down is lying posterior to the brachial artery. It is then piercing from back to front and coming onto the, the medial aspect. So the intermuscular septum here, little distant to the arcade is where it can get kinked. It is actually an irritant. It's the sharp edge of the septum, which keeps irritating the nerve every time you bend and straighten. So it is not direct compression, but it is more of friction, which causes this intermuscular septum to be the culprit. The third spot here is behind the retroepitrochlear groove. So I've taken the nerve in the front when I was doing these cadaveric dissections, but you can see this is the groove where it sits. And there are huge anatomical and morphological uh, variations on the groove depth, on the angles. There are various CT uh, related studies showing how the groove can be, but don't get into that. So you need to make sure that here it's not getting trapped. And I'll tell you how to sensibly divide it. And then the nerve, as it courses down here, is going into the cubital tunnel. So this, again, is a very consistent landmark and a consistent anatomical morphology. Now, this, again, is, again, a big devil. In 70 to 80 percent of cubital tunnel syndromes, this Osborne's ligament is the culprit. And uh, Osborne, he was, again, an anatomist in Wales. Jeffrey Warren Osborne, mind you, he used to do anatomy dissections, and he said that this is a consi consistent band. It's interesting, if you look at Osborne's life, came the World War, and all the anatomists and teachers in UK were told to join the army and become surgeons. So he was then forced to join the army. And then he developed massive Crohn's disease and had to undergo major surgery. So then he came back to civilian life, and he again rejoined uh, Wales, and then he moved to Liverpool. So, you know, we had a, a book there at Liverpool where we read about Osborne's life. And Osborne is also famous for the MacFarlane Osborne's approach on the hip. So this sheath here is, again, a very consistent feature. And it's nothing but a fascia between the ulna and the humeral heads of the FCU that creates the roof of the cubital tunnel. If you see his original article, he would use a three centimeter incision precisely over the course of the ulna nerve, and he would just release this, like how we do a carpal tunnel, and he's saying it's done. You don't need to extend and dissect the whole length of the ulna nerve. And you have to be slightly mindful. The interstitial pressures can increase in elbow flexion even after you release the Osborne's ligament. So once you divide this, it is a bit of a guesswork. There is no exact science on table, but it's your feel, whether this is still tight and whether you should be going all the way distally or you should be stopping at this level. So I personally go all the way down, but you know we'll talk about that later. So the pressures will increase in elbow flexion even after the release of Osborne's ligament. So don't raise the victory flag. You haven't won the battle yet. You need to make sure you track the nerve all the way distally. And as you go down, sorry, can we get that out of the way? Uh, yeah. So as we go down here, you see that the fibrous bands within the FCU can also compress the nerve. So all the way from here, you need to go down. So if you're a purist and if you're doing a good thorough ulnar nerve decompression, you need to go six to eight centimeters up and five centimeters at least into the FCU belly till you free all these bands and then the nerve will course freely as you move distally. So look at that. The ulnar nerve as you go further is sitting on the profundi after passing through the two heads of the FCU. And then it goes pretty much uncompromised all the way to the Gaon's canal. So, as I said, a good ulnar nerve decompression, eight centimeters above to five, which means it's a 13 centimeter, which means you need a generous cut. So don't hesitate about making nice extensile incisions and expose your ulna nerve. Now, complex TY fractures, redo TY fractures, paratricipital approach, this Pandora's box keeps opening again and again. Should you be transposing or you should not be transposing? This is still an unsolved issue. The jury is still open. At every upper extremity meeting, you'll see the right corner and the left corner, both vociferously fighting for their thought processes. We'll talk about this. And in fact, when we have the international jury as well, or the international faculty, we will pick on their brains. So how do you decide? I think for a general orthopedic surgeon, often when you're doing fracture work, you will find the nerve there 
and you'll see the metal sitting very close to it. And does direct metal and the nerve have a bearing? Do you feel that is a cause of traction neuritis? You know, my gut feeling is no. Every time we do a humerus plating, you're putting the plate bang posterior and your radial nerve is sitting directly in contact with the metal. And even after 20 or 30 year follow-up, we don't see radial nerve palsies. So direct metal and nerve is not that bad an idea or we don't need to worry about it too much. What you need to worry about it is how the nerve excursion is playing out. The key is, do you transpose or you don't transpose? I showed you in the second slide, the blood flow is coming from the back and inferiorly. So you have to be really mindful and sure what you're doing before you're stripping it out. It's like taking a child from the mother to the stepmother. So you have to be mindful of what you're doing. How do you decide when to transpose? My rough thumbnail rule is that after you release it, and if you feel that the medial epicondylar edge is here, so that's the uh, forceps, if this flips beyond the margin, every time I'm bending and straightening, and particularly the 90 to 135 arc is where you have to be very careful. You'll find that from full extension to 90, it's behaving itself. But as you go into high flexion arcs, that's when it will move out. And if that's happening, then you have to consider, and the alarm bell should ring that, look, is decompression alone, or do I need to top it up with something else? Simple medial epicondylectomy works, actually. When you're doing a decompression, all you do is release the nerve thoroughly and take off about five or seven millimeters. That's all what you require here of the epicondyle. And the nerve will sit beautifully inside. So that's the one you can use small drills and connect it with an osteotome. If you have an intelligent assistant, you can put a malleable retractor and you can use the power saw. And the whole piece just comes out in your hand very neatly with a pair of forceps and you shave the medial epicondyle, just be careful that you don't damage the anterior band of the MC. Once the epicondyle is off, shave it, rasp it, and put the nerve back into its bed and loosely cover it. So once you've put it back in, take very loose stitches and make sure your artery clip is freely going in. It's a bit like doing your shoulder impingement surgery. How do you check whether the acromion is still hitting the cuff? So, Make sure this is sitting comfortably and then reattach the flexor masses very loosely without really causing local entrapment. Now, there comes a time when the average orthopedic surgeon will have to decide whether is he transposing and you know, whether you're doing anterior, subcuticular, subfascial, submuscular transfers. This is something which if you've not done regularly, you will need the help of a plastic surgeon. So anterior subcutaneous technique works, but you need a podgy hand. You need a chubby hand where you have enough fatty tissue for the nerve to remain protected. Otherwise, once you transpose the nerve, patients will hate it. You just tap along it and they get massive tunnels. If someone grabs the hand unintentionally, they get a lot of pain. So it's not that easy a procedure. It is an easy procedure, but the aftermath can be troublesome for the patient. So then you can use a facial sling off the flexor mass and just gather it there so that the transposition, what you've done from back to front, doesn't flop back. This is the tricky one, intramuscular transpositions. I don't think, unless you're doing this regularly, you will venture into it, but I'll show you how to do it. Do a cadaveric dissection before you want to do an intramuscular transfer. It can stump you. You need to do a submuscular Z plasty of the flexor pronator mass. So you map it out first, see where the native nerve is going, see where you want to bring it in the front. So when will, when will I consider this? Only when someone has transposed the nerve anteriorly and the patient still has severe neuritis or there is worsening and wasting of the intraocyte power and bulk. Here you're forced to do a submuscular. You can't take it back because now you've burnt your bridges there. So you will have to move forward. So you do a Z-plasty, you prepare your flaps, let the nerve comfortably sit there nicely in the front and make sure when you bend and straighten the elbow, it, the excursions are smooth and there is just no pressure. And then you repair the Z-plasty again loosely, make sure that the nerve is coming out at the distal end, going in at the proximal end, and this muscular pad is just buttressing it there, holding it there without it subluxating. And keep it loose, as I said, you want no local constriction. Mind you, even submuscular transfers can bite you big time. You can have scar tissue of this muscle bulk entrapping it there, and you can devascularize it further. So there is no such thing as free lunch. You have to be mindful all the time. If you look in literature on the transposition issue, whether to transpose or not, as I said, you've got the red corner and the, and the blue corner. So Wang's paper, routine transposition, 
he would say it's indicated. He would regularly do ORF and transfer. You look at Chen's patients, you know, these are the papers which are quoted for all transposition uh, related papers which you're writing. So he said routine ulnar nerve transposition is not recommended during ORF. And he said, keep it in his native bed. And then came Vasquez. He said, we don't have enough data. We need more tightly controlled, randomized prospective data to show whether we should transpose or not. And he said, I don't believe it's worth transposing. So he said, large cohort is required before we answer this. And this is again, a debatable topic, which I will ask uh, uh, Dr. Zahra and his team to have this when we have the foreign faculty talking to us. So finally, what are your take home messages? We all know about the figures related to the carpal tunnel syndrome, but just think of the ulnar nerve and say 50, 40, NCV of 50 milliseconds is normal. Less than 40 is abnormal. So easy to remember, 50 is normal, 40 is abnormal. So when you see the AMG nerve conduction study report, less than 40, penny should drop. Ulnar nerve is your friend or your foe. You decide from what I've just said, but I do think you know it's a huge favor nature is doing to us as far as the ulnar nerve is concerned. My own view, I don't transpose that frequently. I prefer to decompress it in situ as far as possible. And even when I do elbow replacements, I try to keep it in its native bed. And as I said, revision after transposition is a tricky affair. So if you've transposed the nerve and if the patient is not happy, you are really in troubled waters. So you have to be careful what you're doing on day one. Thank you for your kind hearing. Thank you, Dr. Parab. <clears throat> a very detailed presentation on Allen now. And I'm sure all of us have seen our assistants hanging on to the Allen now while doing an elbow surgery. And it definitely is a friend. Thank you. You have any quick questions? You can ask one. <clears throat> okay, so we move on to the uh, next lecture. It is from our international faculty. You will not see him on physically here today. Uh, as he is in UK, he's our own Desi boy sitting in Angrezi land. And he will be talking about, he's a Sussex based uh, uh, consultant and orthopedic surgeon specializing in shoulder and elbow surgery. Dr. Joydee Ferdness uh, is in UK and he will be talking about uh, distal humerus articular fractures. Well, firstly, thank you for the invite uh, to talk at this event. My name is Joydeep Fadnis. I'm an elbow specialist based at Brighton and Sussex University Hospitals in um, the south of England in the UK. And I'm, I'm going to talk to you about distal humeral articular fractures uh, today. So these fractures are sometimes called coronal shear fractures, but I like to talk about them as articular fractures because um, often they have fracture lines, not just in the coronal plane. And um, we can pick them up on the x-rays by these variable uh, number of arcs that you see. And here we can um, see three separate arcs indicating a very comminuted fracture of the articular surface. And you'll, you'll note that the fracture is distal to the uh, epicondyles. 
Um, these fractures are challenging because they're often thin, multiple small fragments, and they can be very difficult to access, even especially in the more advanced uh, fractures, and therefore difficult to get rigid fixation from. The initial classification um, was just a descriptive classification based um, primarily on the capitellum and then with some later acknowledgement that most of these fractures actually include the trochlea not just the capitellum but it was really Ring and Jupiter who first noted that there were typical zones of fracture um, going from lateral to medial that could be involved um, as the fracture severity got more severe but these are all descriptive um, I based treatment on the modified doubly classification, so this was described originally by Graham King's group and then we added a type 4 which basically reflects a fracture with um, fracture lines in multiple planes. Now the real crux of this classification is that um, it, look, it talks about posterior comminution in the subtype uh, B and um, in the subtype A there's the posterior column is intact and this is really important for decision making which I'll talk to you about soon. And we know now that severity correlates with the outcome and, and hence um, my surgical treatment and the rest of this talk will be based on this classification. So why um, do we talk about posterior comminution? Well, it dictates the type of fixation devices we might need. If there's um, uh, the posterior column is intact, we can use screws um, from whichever direction you like, whereas if it's um, uh, fractured and comminuted, then we need uh, plates or arthroplasty to recreate that cortex. So other than posterior comminution, um, it's also important preoperatively to look at the extent of the articular involvement. So I always recommend getting a CT scan and assessing the quality of the subcontral bone stock, i.e. how big are the fragments themselves, as well as being aware that many of these have associated ligamentous injuries and sometimes radial head fractures. In this study that we did, um, we reviewed our practice uh, treating the doubly uh, according to the doubly system and uh, what we found was that outcomes were worse if posterior comminution was not treated appropriately with plates or arthroplasty, so it just drives home that message. So when we're planning to uh, treat these injuries, um, we want to adopt a systematic approach understand the fracture type, which will influence our approach, our positioning, and what techniques we use for fixation. So screw fixation is the most common. You can use headless screws or locking screws or, or normal screws. And the real controversy comes in what type of screw to use. Now these are appropriate um, for screws alone in the subtype A, where there's no posterior comminution. Um, the only two studies that really look at the type of screw orientation and its importance are by the same group and you'll note that they're very old studies and in fact uh, in the first study they found that PA screws were superior to AP but if you look at the detail these were using 4mm cancellous screws and, and the reason the PA were better is that when they were placed AP there were cracks in the articular surface. A subsequent study showed that headless AP screws were superior to PA cancellous screws, but again, these were the first generation screws, so much bigger and really not applicable to what um, we practice today. So when we have posterior comminution, we need to recreate the cortex with a plate if we're fixing the fracture and use fixed angle screws through the plate. Sometimes we might have to disimpact the posterior part of the capitellum and use either the iliac crest bone graft or some graft from the olecranon. Most of these fractures can be treated through a standard lateral approach, which needs to be a bit more extensile. Um, we use an EDC splitting approach distally and then run up the lateral column of the humerus in a supine position. And by doing this, we stay quite anterior to address the anterior fragments. If we need to, um, uh, and we can fix all these types of fractures, uh, even those type threes, because we can get quite an extensile approach to uh, the central trochlea. Now, for the more complex fractures, we need to think about um, extensile variations of the lateral approach. 
Um, and these uh, essentially involve subluxating the elbow on the intact MCL. So either we can reflect the lateral ligament or more often exploit an existing lateral epicondyle fracture or create an epicondyle osteotomy. We can also do um, posterior column plating uh, by um, sparing the lateral collateral ligament and making a, a cocker's interval posteriorly and an EDC split um, anteriorly. What do I mean by exploiting the epicondyle fracture? Well, most of these advanced fracture types, if you look carefully on the CT, have an existing epicondyle fracture on the lateral side, which we can reflect, subluxate the joint, fix from medial out to lateral, and then repair um, the lateral collateral ligament and the epicondyle as part of the final construct. Here's an example of that. You can see an epicondyle fracture with a comminuted articular component fixed with a lateral plate and multiple screws. Well, what about these really advanced fractures where they're type 3 and 4, um, very comminuted? We need even more uh, advanced types of approaches and fixation techniques. And I want to draw your attention to the lateral paraelectronon approach, which is my go-to. Um, other approaches often used are the paratriceps or the electronon osteotomy or even combined approaches. But I prefer the lateral paraelectronon. And in this cadaveric study, it was shown that um, the lateral paraelectronon gave a much um, superior uh, exposure of the articular part through subluxation and even dislocation of the joint compared to an electronon osteotomy. Here's an example of the lateral paraelectronon approach in a case we did recently. Essentially, this uh, involves reflecting um, the anconeus of the uh, ulna in, in essentially a buoyed interval distally and then splitting the triceps in its uh, midline proximally and it takes us right down onto the articular fragments we can then reflect that lateral epicondyle fracture and in this case subluxate the whole distal humerus now if you need a really big exposure we can release the medial sided structures as well um, however you need to be cognizant that the articular the blood supply to this um, a very medial trochlea is dependent on the uh, blood supply coming from the flexors in the lateral, in the medial epicondyle. So you want to do this only in the most advanced fractures. But we get this sort of view where we can really anatomically reduce these really bad fractures, get stable, rigid fixation, but it's essential that we stabilize the ligaments to allow immediate range of motion post surgery. What about alternate fixation techniques? Um, I'll give you examples of all these techniques. Here's, an, here's a patient who had a very a thin shell of bone from the capitellum, but in, this is an 18-year-old boy, including the whole capitellum. So rather than screws, we use PDS uh, suture through drill holes, and um, he had a very good result. We can use threaded K wires uh, for these really comminuted distal fragments um, as a raft to, to raft up the um, articular surface and then use supplementary screws and plates to neutralize those wires. Anti-glide plating has got quite a nice adjunct for the very um, unstable fragments without any periosteal hinge. So we just use a simple plate um, to neutralize the um, shear forces. But you've got to be careful to avoid impingement and flexion when you use these. Independent locking screws, we published on this. Um, I, I prefer to use these over um, headless screws because it means we can use much smaller screws and we simply bury the uh, heads into the articular surface with the, using the threads on the head of the locking screw and you, we get a really powerful grip in the bone. And finally, um, if you're well versed with arthroscopic techniques, there's some role uh, for arthroscopy in the more simple uh, fractures. Here's a case where I thought it would be useful because we had an undisplaced um, coronoid fracture as well as uh, a, a capitella uh, trochlear fracture. So we can view from um, both portals and at the same time with very small incisions end up fixing both the coronoid and uh, the capitella. 
And then finally, always consider arthroplasty. These fractures, um, when they're type 4, particularly in older patients, are very amenable to arthroplasty because the condyles are intact and the patients do really well following arthroplasty as long as the decision making for that is correct. And I prefer a hemiarthroplasty um, where possible, but total elbow also has excellent results. So in summary, these are challenging fractures. You need a systematic strategy to treat them and, you, and a knowledge of varied techniques and approaches which should be tailored to specific patients. And remember, pay attention to posterior comminution. If you want to read more about this topic in more detail, um, then um, I'll reference this paper that we wrote a few years back. Thank you for listening. So as Joydeep is not there for questions, uh, so we'll have interactive session now after this. And for this, I invite Dr. Prasad Chaudhary, who is our own professor here at Nivai Patel Medical College. He will present a case which is open for everybody in online for our foreign faculty. A uh, few of them are online right now, live. So we'll discuss this case. Meanwhile, I can, uh, there is tea available also. You can grab a cup of tea if you want and come back uh, if you're a little need of tea. Otherwise, we'll continue with the session. Dr. Prasad. Mm -hmm. Now what? Yeah, thank you, BOS, um, for this opportunity. I'll be presenting a few elbow cases. So let's start with the first case. So we have a very young 23-year-old rickshaw driver by profession. He sustained a road traffic accident while he was riding pillion on a motorcycle. And this happened uh, in the first week of February. So he was taken to a government facility where he was uh, put in a uh, slab. An x-ray was done, he was put in a slab. I want to go ahead. Oh, what? So these were his X-rays as presentation. So uh, he had this kind of presentation on X-ray. He was also advised the CT scan, and the CT scan showed a radial head fracture with an elbow dislocation. So he was just put in a slab, and at three days, when the swelling receded, he was put in a cast. So while he was in a cast, uh, the patient noticed some decrease in the finger movements of his fourth and the fifth fingers. And on removal of the cast, after one month of trauma, the patient had developed a significant ulnar claw and decreased sensation in the distribution of the ulnar nerve. And he was offered operative management after a after month of the index injury. This is all we have, basically. This is, uh, this is what was done. A posterior approach was taken and a wire was put. So post-surgery, uh, there was no significant improvement and he was discharged day five. His implant removal was day 14 and he developed a fixed flexion deformity and there was further deterioration in the sensation and the movements after that. He present to, presented to us uh, in the third week of April. So he was almost um, two months post-trauma with a elbow deformity and a ulnar nerve palsy. These are his X-rays as presentation, and we got a CT scan which shows some residual subluxation of the ulnar humeral um, joint. 
this is his clinical photo. He has this scar at present. These are his movements, his, his developed perfection deformity. His, his just a jog of movements. His severe restriction of pronosopination also. So um, these are his clinical pics, pronosopination. And this is what he has. He has presently an ulna claw. So I would like just like um, a few questions I would like to ask our eminent faculty. I'll start with Prof. Uh, uh, Paraksha, Dr. Paraksha. Um, are you there? Uh, yes, absolutely, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, Perfect. Uh, I would like to know, I mean, what should be the further uh, course of action in this particular Okay. Uh, right. So, you know, it's a complex situation. A couple of months down the line, uh, uh, a contracted uh, uh, elbow and a severe uh, ulnar neuropathy. Uh, obviously, there is uh, a role of preoperative um, uh, you know, nerve studies to make sure what we are dealing with, uh, apart from just uh, what is obvious. But uh, at two, two and a half months uh, with, uh, with a subluxed um, uh, elbow along with an ulnar uh, neuropathy. For me, uh, this would be sort of a, an indication for an extensile uh, 360 release of the elbow, uh, relocating the elbow. Uh, and uh, I would uh, probably go for an in-situ uh, decompression. And as Dr. Munshi had mentioned, uh, I like to consider the uh, ulnar nerve as my friend. and. Uh, it's a very unusual circumstances where I actually transpose the nerve. But here, obviously, I would definitely look at what's going on and, uh, you know, uh, look, hopefully the nerve is still intact and uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, decompress the nerve. So that, that is one part is the nerve issue and the other is uh, the stiffness and the uh, instability part of it. So I would do an open reduction. And then what we've been using uh, for the past couple of years is uh, based on the work of Dr. Jorge uh, Orbe from Miami. And I use uh, uh, an indigenous kind of uh, an internal joint stabilizer. I have uh, a case in my talk on the terrible triad. So that is what I would do you know, in this particular case. Yeah, uh, can I ask? Uh... Professor, you know, is he there? Is Professor, you know, there? Okay. Uh, can we ask Professor Wada? If he's there. Okay, we can ask. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Munshi, would you like to comment on this case? After the question is after two months, um, is uh, ulna now neurolysis likely to um, recover? recover? So, you know, as we look at it, there are two issues. One is the ulnar nerve. Two, you have a slightly incongruent joint. And as an offshoot, the third problem is stiffness. Now, if you go back and if you see what that surgeon with the posterior approach has done, is there any mention what they found of the ulnar nerve and what he has done to the nerve? No, as you said, the, the notes are very, very inadequate. Okay, so the notes were inadequate. Two, one, I would first start with doing an ultrasound to see where the nerve is. And is the nerve intact or is there any disruption? So in my mind, the hand is quite important. You need to salvage the nerve first or know the status of the nerve. So EMG and CV and imaging, whether it's the MR or the ultrasound to see whether there is any structural damage or whether the cable is continuous, i.e. the fascicles are intact. Now, once you've established that, then you have to see what is happening to the instability issue. So I would then just do a simple EUA first to see what is going on under CRM control, because what you see with a patient in the OPD and what you'll find under EU is grossly uh, different. So you have to develop a game plan for him. Sorry. So first is knowing what's happening to the ulnar nerve and then knowing how bad the instability issue is. 
the stiffness is the third part which you can always tackle with a generous arthrolysis so that i would hold on also he's had a radial head fracture now whether that has healed and it's congruent or that also is establishing some degree of pain locally so this is the first thing and then you tackle step by step or you decide whether can you do the ulnar nerve and st instability at one go or can you do ulnar nerve instability and stiffness all at one go so at the moment these three answers we require and then we need to decide what we are doing we are committed with a posterior long extensile approach so you may have to use that again but you know often i do collateral as well so i'm not worried about one long incision and just sticking to that but we need adequate information on the situation first before we say what we are doing as i said priority one is get the ulnar nerve picture very clear and do everything possible to salvage the nerve first so we have one uh, uh, conduction study which says it's an ulnar neuropathy so that's the only baseline study that we are having um, any role of uh, primary radial head resection uh, during this uh, uh, the the index the surgery that we'll plan would you would you like to just see the only the ulnar nerve or would you like to do something to the radial head just excise it right now now that it is stiff so you know the the decision for me is eua based once you take the patient under anesthesia i would certainly image the ulnar nerve to confirm that there is no structural damage so you've got severe ulnar neuropathy but the way his hand is wasted it's more than that it's not just neuropraxia you've got something more going on and the and the peculiar part is he would have had a major subluxation on day one, which was reduced, and therefore the X-ray looks innocuous. On day one, if you had done an EO, you would have found that the whole thing is opening up with the medial structure disrupted as well. So, if the ulnar nerve is absolutely intact, that's a transaction. You guys all the slow part. You did your visitors, right? Yeah. Hi. Join us in the morning. Welcome. So, you know, I would not dive in. There are often patients who might take for EUA alone. Do the imaging, do the NCV, do the EUA alone, and then plan it. So you're not under pressure to do something under anesthesia. So let it be in stages. So we need proper information on what we are doing. As regards excision of the radial head alone, is it an option? Yes, provided now that the MCL on the medial side, your structures are totally tight and well healed. But if you're saying that there is residual instability now, you need to address that as well. So if you were to excise it, or if you were to do something, I would say you replace the radial head if it's bad and do your soft tissue reconstruction on the medial side. Don't dive in, but yes, it is an option. Thank you. Um, can I ask Professor Eno uh, uh, about his insights in the case? Um, yes, you are quite right. I totally agree. The radial head excision can be an valuable option in whatever situation if you see any community fracture. But in this particular case, you should be very careful because the medial side soft tissue is not really intact. So I had a, a really a bad idea, a bad experience with this sort of injuries because after radial head recession, the whole elbow became unstable and eventually the patient had a chronic persistent subluxation at the end. So, uh, once you make a decision to excise the radial head, make sure that your medial collateral ligament and lateral collateral ligament complex are intact. Okay, over to you. Thank you. Hi, uh, sorry, can I, uh, can I add uh, something at this stage? Yeah. So again, you know, from the videos, I feel that he's got uh, good rotations, right? Uh, no, his rotations are very, very limited. This, this, these are his rotations. The rotations are severely restricted. Okay. So on the other side, it's, it doesn't even come to neutral. Right. Okay. Fair enough. So that, that's probably one of the uh, situations where you have to look at what the, how, how is the radius it articulating uh, you know, uh, with uh, the at the PRUJ as well as the radiocapitular joint. Uh, again, you know, looking at the X-rays, I'm not sure about how badly malunited it is. But uh, if you do choose to excise it, I would probably replace it uh, at the same time as well. Uh, in such a severely uh, stiff elbow, I personally would not 
uh, reconstruct uh, ligaments at this particular stage. But as I said, I would use um, an infix to stabilize the elbow and uh, also uh, start early range of motion. Thank you. Can we go ahead with the next case? So the next case, again, a 33-year-old housewife. She had a fall, a trivial fall. She tried to break her fall uh, with her outstretched hand. And she, again, she had complaints of pain and elbow, or, uh, pain and swelling over the right elbow. And she presented to our casualty uh, with this kind of an X-ray. And she was uh, put in a slab and advised to come back with a CT scan. So these are the CT images. We just saw that only there was just a sectoral involvement of the radial head and it's not, uh, it was not completely, um, uh, there's no neck fracture. The, there was sectoral involvement of the radial head. And she was, uh, after three weeks of putting in a slab uh, till the eventual swelling went away, she was, she underwent physiotherapy for uh, three weeks. She had persistent stiffness and was not really happy with this. So her extension to flexion was around 40 to 110 degree arc. And there was some so pronous supination which was uh, restricted. We offered her a radial head excision. So this was um, uh, six weeks post injury, this X-ray when we offered her a radial head excision. So, these are our intraoptics. Um, uh, I was very happy with the excision of the radial head. And show me, is this, yeah. These are her, uh, the range under anesthesia prior to the excision. It was 40 and And, this, and after excision, I was pretty happy with the range that I got. I got pretty good supination and pronation. Yeah, the, these are the x-rays post-excision and it shows some kind of a shadow uh, which are still there, I think, in the soft tissues. So um, these are the x-rays. This is the x-ray on in hindsight, I just went back and looked and this was the x-ray on presentation. This was the x-ray just prior to the excision, which shows that there is some, um, the, some fluffy shadows in the soft tissues. And at five years, she was not happy. She was undergoing, uh, but she presented recently at four and a half years. And this is what we have, we saw on the x-ray. And this is where we had resected the radial head. And we thought that we found some bony uh, uh, callus formation or some bony growth uh, at five years. So in hindsight, uh, we wanted to know whether this fluffy shadow, um, was it any significant when we should have considered excision? We even thought that there was some movement of the radial head, uh, um, some instability, uh, Essex low presti type but her uh, distal radial nerve joint uh, x-rays also seem to be pretty okay. This, uh, this is the range right now. Her uh, pronosupination is a bit restricted. Flexion extension is a good range, terminally restriction of that, but the pronosupation has, she was not very happy at presentation, though she had carried on for four and a half years. So my question is, while we take on a radial head, excision, should we do a, consider a primary and corneous arthroplasty in this case? I would like to ask um, Professor Wada, is he there? Uh, Professor, you know, Professor, you know, you're in um, uh, Dr. Prasad, I have one question, actually. The very beginning, the initial x-ray looks not really a bad. This is partial radial head. And what do you think the cause of the elbow, severe elbow stiffness in this case? What really caused the initial stiffness after partial radial head fracture? Uh, so um, what ideally we should have been done is we should have just uh, pushed some lignocaine in the joint 
seen her range of movements, but then that was not done <laughs> earlier. She was just put in a slab. So I think the cause for her, uh, this thing was the earlier immobilization for the first three weeks. So in hindsight, what we should have done is we should have uh, infiltrated the joint with lignocaine, seen her good range of motion. And if she was pretty comfortable, we should have started mobilization uh, at the earliest. But she was continued in the slab for three weeks, and which was mostly the reason for her immobilization, uh, for her stiffness. So uh, whenever I meet any patient with a stiff elbow, always ask what causes this uh, a high grade stiffness, is it because of the bony impingement, a bony issue, or is this soft tissue issue? So when I look at the initial CT scan as you present right now, the fracture does not really look very, very severe. So uh, maybe uh, it's caused by the soft tissue, then uh, the, the, the best option would be a soft tissue release rather than the uh, radial head excision. So, or, Maybe the heterotopic ossification around the radial head fracture or around the uh, elbow joint could be a possible uh, cause of this uh, stiffness. So I would like to hear what your initial thought was there. So these, Dr. Wada, uh, can I uh, ask your opinion on this case? Yes, I, I agree with. Uh, Professor John, uh, I would not reject radio head in this case because uh, fracture was not, not so bad. So uh, I would release the soft tissue first and then see the range of motion interoperatively. Um, if it's good, uh, I'll I would uh, stop this. I would not do uh, radio head replacement. Thank you. Thank you. I think I think that's it. Yes. Uh, Doctor Lu, are you there? Can you can you can yeah, I ask yeah, yes. on I'm this a, uh, Sorry, maybe I missed part of the case because that's answer telephone. Uh, so it is a radio head fracture, and you remove the radio head, and then. A lot of heterotopic ossifications there, right? Am I right? Okay. Well, I think the most inter interesting thing is, due to my experience, uh, there are very high rate of uh, ossification, uh, 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 heterotopic ossification uh, due to the radial head fractures, whether you remove it, you fix it, or you replace it. So, so the, the rate of the hydrotopic ossification is pretty high than any other elbow fractures. So uh, for treating this, I think uh, maybe you should choose a radio head processes instead. I think it is better. Thank you. When, when I look at this X-ray, the, the height, the location of the radial uh, biceps tuberosity, radial tuberosity is not much changed. So it looks really, really interesting whether this is really a kind of regeneration. Because yes, a five-year follow-up. Now I would like to compare this AP X-ray with your uh, initial uh, post-op X-ray. So looking at this uh, biceps tuberosity height, I think not much uh, proximal migration of radial head, but there, you know, somehow the radial head became uh, overgrowth. Looks like a very regeneration. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prasad. <clears throat> Good, nice two cases, and we had a fair bit of discussion on these. <clears throat> so we move on to the next session, which is on elbow instabilities. We have with us
So we have with us uh, our uh, neighbor from our uh, neighboring country, China, Dr. Yi Lu, <laughs> who is an MD, PhD, and he's working in Beijing Ji Shui Tan Hospital. Dr. Lu is also a, a avid elbow surgeon, and he'll be talking oh. about next. Okay, wow. So let's share my screen. Hey, is that okay for everybody? You can see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great, great, thanks. Hello everyone, my name is Yilu from Beijing and uh, I'm very glad to have this opportunity attending such wonderful meeting and share my experience on the role of arthroscopic management of stiff elbow. Well, traditionally, the open release technique is widely used for stiff elbow treatment. For example, this is a young guy got stiff elbow after an accident and then improper initial treatment. During the surgery, we had to remove all the scar tissue, hydrotopic ossification tissue from bilateral approach because open release sometimes would damage important structures. So we use an external fixator for protection temporarily. And two months later, we remove the external fixator with good range of motion. Although most of studies reported that good clinical outcome can be expected by open release technique, both patients and surgeons nowadays try to find another better way much less invasive and much cosmetic way to treat stiff elbow. The question is, is this minimal invasive technique better than the open release? If we look at the literature since 1993, we can find as the arthroscopic technique is at least the same as effective as open technique, but on one condition. We should follow the right way and pay attention to this key point when we use arthroscopic technique. It's including proper portal setup, completely synovectomy and loose body removal, osteophyte osteotomy as little as possible, but capsulectomy as much as possible as we can, and then sometimes release the outer nerve when necessary. First, the proper portal setup is very important issue. Anatomically, medial and posterior portal are always safe because they all locate far away from the nerve and vascular structures. On the lateral side, the proximal anterior lateral portal is much safer than the anterior lateral portals because the latter is much close to the radial nerve. So if it is possible, choose proximal anterior lateral portal instead of anterior lateral portals during the whole procedure. The more proximal to the joint, the much dangerous to the radial nerve. Second, synovectomy should be done before any other procedures. It can provide a clear, a very clear view, make further procedures safe. Besides, complete bursectomy will remove all bursitis, which can relieve pain after the surgery, especially for those uh, rheumatoid arthritis or other arthritis patients. Sir, remove loose body from different portals. Loose body is always the reason for mechanical locking. These three bodies always locate in the coronal fossa and radial fossa anteriorly and the auricular fossa posteriorly. So if you cannot find the loose body during the surgery, find them in the fossa and don't believe X-ray because 30% of loose body cannot be found by routine X-ray. CT scan, especially 3D CT is always needed. Since loose body seldom result into elbow contracture, take them out alone cannot treat stiffness itself. So don't tell your stiff elbow patients that after removal free bodies, then everything is okay. No, this is not true. First, remove osteophyte as little as possible. 
osteophyte can cause impingement, which should be removed to get full range of motion. But must, uh, but much osteotomy would result in much bleeding later, and then much problem after the operation, such as edema, infection, or recurrent stiffness. So always check the range of motion when perform osteotomy and stop when no impingement occur. Do not do too much osteotomy. But when we remove the capsule, both anteriorly and posterior capsule should be removed as much as, much as possible. During the surgery, only cut the capsule is not enough. The whole capsule with its insertion on the humor side should all be removed by your shaver. And it is the effective way to prevent adhesion after the surgery. But of course, you should be very careful when the shaver on the anterior part of the riddle head, because it is very close to the riddle nerve. Do not too much to damage the riddle nerve. And the outer nerve sometimes need to be, oh, sorry, uh, the outer nerve sometimes need to be released, but it is technical demanding procedure if you release under the scope. So if you think you are not so experienced, then mini open release on the cubital tunnel can be another proper choice. Whether anterior transfer of the nerve or not is totally due to the patient syndrome preoperatively. But according to my personal experience, the local release is enough in most instances. With this key point in mind, release the stiff uh, elbow can always get satisfied result. For example, this is a middle-aged man with stiff elbow for almost one year. During the operation, we put the scope in soft spot portal first, then synovectomy and the loose body removal in the anterior compartment of the joint from different portals, and then cut the anterior capsule and remove it completely from both sides, and followed by osteophyte osteo osteotomy on the coronal fossa and radial head fossa to let the patient get full flexion without impingement. This is uh, what we've done in the anterior part com compartment. The similar, procedure, uh, the similar procedure was performed on the posterior compartment of the joint. Stenovectomy to get a very clear view is very important. Then check the motion, osteotomy if necessary when, uh, when the impingement occurred and on the oliquinin fossa and tip of the oliquinin, but just remove as little as possible to prevent the bleeding. After the surgery, the patient can begin the rehabilitation program at once due to this minimal invasive technique. This is another young lady, post-traumatic stiffness. According to the problem of, uh, what happened? Sorry. According to the problem of internal uh, fixation, we have to remove the screw which penetrate into the joint and uh, have to remove all scar tissue, heterotopic ossification, and then she can get good range of motion after the second operation. A study shows that the clinical outcome of arthroscopic management for stiff elbow at one to two years was satisfied. There were no significant difference among three months, six months, and the last time follow up, which means you can tell your patient what the final result at three months after the operation. So it is much predictable than open procedure. For open procedure, sometimes you have to let your patient wait, wait, and wait, maybe more than half a year and then you can find the uh, final result. Also, after follow-up 36 patients on um, 72 years, uh, 70, sorry, 72 months on average. A study shows that there were no significant difference between six months and last time follow-up. So good clinical outcome of arthroscopic management for stiff elbow can be maintained till many years. But of course, arthroscopic technique also has complications. Even it is a very minimal invasive technique. We once reported our complications um, a couple of years ago. 
among 205 patients, severe complication with need further surgical intervention occurred in six patients, which including three neuropathy, two recurrent stiffness, and one heterotopic ossification. So heterotopic ossification can occur even in this minimal invasive technique, do you believe that? But it will occur. So we should be always very careful and treat everything we can to avoid complications. Well, in summary, although arthroscopy release is nowadays widely used, it's still technical demanding. Some points need to, to be paid attention to. And complications should be avoided as possible as we can. And nowadays, I do believe with the development of our skill and technology, the clinical outcome of stiff elbow treatment would become better and better in the, in the future. And last time, I want to show my appreciation, appreciation again for this opportunity to join this wonderful meeting. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lu. If there are any questions, he's there live to answer your questions. <clears throat> Dr. Lu, there's a question from our... Yeah, uh, Dr. Lu, thank you for your talk. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Very clear. So, so in all your cases where you do an elbow arthrolysis uh, through the scope, do you do a manipulation first or do you do a manipulation at the end? Yeah, I... I prefer to manipulation in the end, but usually not necessary to do any manipulation. And are you injecting intra-articular steroids at the end of the uh, No, 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 because I do believe the steroid injection may, will, will, will add a high risk for the infection after the surgery. So I never do that. But I do believe some sort of believes the steroid injection can prevent uh, pen after the operation, yeah, but uh, still controversy on that. <laughs> For me, I, I don't do that. And uh, do you treat uh, them prophylactically to prevent uh, post-op HO? Uh, for the open procedure, yes, I do. But uh, for the minimal invasive technique, uh, for example, as a scopic technique, no, never, not necessary. I never meet a uh, heterotopic ossification uh, after the arthroscopic technique, except one case, just I showed you in the PPT. This case, the patient leaves the hospital, never uh, listened to your advice on the supervision. And uh, three, uh, three months later, he came back and found what happened in the end. So yeah, for the arthroscopic technique, not necessary to to, to, to take indomethacin or some NSAID medicines. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, can, I, can I ask a question to Dr. Lu? Sure, sure, please. Uh, Dr. Lu, wonderful presentation on the arthroscopic techniques, uh, very advanced uh, ways of releasing uh, a stiff elbow. I do extensive releases, but almost all of them are open. Uh, heterotopic ossification is something which, which is very confusing because we don't know whom it's going to happen. Uh, my question is, uh, recently I had a case of a young lad who had vascular injury to his uh, elbow with a brachial artery injury, where it was, uh, it was uh, repaired with a, with a graft and obviously had to be immobilized for a bit. Now, he presented to me uh, three months later with, with, a, with a stiff elbow with, uh, with a heterotopic ossification in the posteromedial aspect uh, of his elbow. So he had no motion, his arm was stuck in about uh, you know, 40 degrees of uh, uh, extension. And uh, I went in, I excised, I did not do it arthroscopic because it's very close to the ulnar nerve. So yeah, I sure, released sure. the ulnar nerve and completely took off the bony mass and at the same time did a posterior anterior capsulectomies. So on table, he had full range of motion. And uh, we put a supraclavicular catheter in these patients for the early post-op uh, mobilization. And he went home with full range of motion and comes back at six weeks with exactly the same position that I started out with. 
struck again at about 40 degrees with no HO. There is no heterotrophic ossification right now. Uh, what are the mechanisms, you know, that uh, might lead to this again after releasing the capsule, releasing, removing the HO, uh, getting full range of motion under anesthetic, uh, getting full range of motion when the patient is under a block before he went home, and then, you know, comes back with exactly the same deformity position. Uh, and I, I am really flummoxed at why should this happen? And this is not the only case. There are patients who after complete release still seem to be stuck at the same uh, position. So are there some neural mechanisms or is it uh, muscle which contracts again? What is your take on this situation? And have you encountered this in your case? Thanks for your question. Uh, I'm in the same similar situation uh, many years ago because uh, I also do open procedure. <laughs> Uh, you know, sometimes the muscular contracture is the most important issue. You cannot do anything to prevent that. Uh, one of the uh, useful technique is to use external fixator. You know, the external fixator sometimes is very, very uh, useful to prevent the muscle contraction. So sometimes I even put the external fixator on my uh, patient's body till three months. But usually just two months is enough. But usually, but sometimes I were uh, elongation. Okay. Would Dr. Gion, Dr. Vada, yeah. or, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Parag, can yes, I sir. ask you a question? Does this really happen very often after your elbow surgery? I mean, not, this... not, not very often, but I would say that this wasn't the first case. Mm -hmm. Oh, you so, know, you know, yes, all, for... sometimes, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, going. You know, if, yeah, you know, you know, sometimes it's very frequency if you do the vascular reconstruction or the uh, nerve reconstruction. Yeah, it's very often occur. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Jian. Yes, uh, what I'm saying is, yes, uh, we, we cannot make it successful uh, every time but uh, the what i would like to say is something happened after your surgery uh, in between you after your surgery and patient's follow-up so during this period of time what has happened to the patient this is a critical i do agree some component of muscular contracture like the shortening of biceps and triceps can be a cause of this uh, later uh, delay the tardy uh, contracture again, but muscular component definitely need, can be uh, cured or improved with the rehabilitation. But, you know, uh, you have a good uh, protocol surgery, good postal protocol with the interscalar block. If your patient had a good continuous passive and active assisted, I think surgery should not, uh, the, the result would, should not be something like that. So uh, we can really generalize this uh, complicated case, but at least uh, I would say arthroscope open is not an issue. Thing is yeah. whether we release the old pathologic soft tissue properly and then do a proper postal protocol, pain control, rehabilitation, then at least the sur surgical outcome should be reliable. Uh, I think Dr. Wada has a lot of experience on open release, so may have some comment on this. Thank you. And uh, did, did you say the heterotopic ossification recurred, right? No, there, was, there was no recurrence of uh, heterotopic ossification. We have imaged him. We have had a fresh CT, which suggests that there is no recurrence uh, in the first, in, at, at the six, eight week mark. And uh, I very routinely prescribe endomethacin for all my patients who undergo uh, HO release. So he gets 75 milligrams of an extended release indomethacin once a day, and he was still on it. So uh, there is no recurrence, at least as of the current follow-up. Okay. And in my experience, after uh, the open release of the stiff elbow and uh, start the rehabilitation, about the one month after operation, uh, range of motion get worse. 
Okay. Yeah. But if you continue to do a rehabilitation, then getting better and better. So in, in, in such a, so your patient returned three months, right? No, one month. One month. Yeah, it is the worst postoperative phase, I think. So okay. yeah, you uh, continue rehab. Yeah. Thank you, that's, uh, that's very yes, reassuring. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have one question for the deliveries. Uh, the guy just opened the Do they find a full of uh, local application of intermittent? Does local application of intermittent has any role in HO? Preventing HO? Dr. Dr. Asha is asking if there is any role of local application of Indomethacin. Anybody? Can I have never thought about it, but uh, how do you do a local application? I mean, okay. you can break a capsule and put in the granules or something. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Something like that. Yes. I have never thought about it as yet, and I am not aware of uh, anybody. Professor, you know, we had discussed this once. Yeah, uh, Ashe, uh, that's a that's a really a brilliant idea, but I do not have any experience on that because still we do not understand exactly exactly what kind of a pathophysiology happens in forming a therotopic ossification. But surely any anti-inflammatory in the initial post-op would be helpful, including the, uh, 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 as you mentioned, the indomethacin or any kind of cell like coxib. I think it would work in an early phase. But my... Uh, question actually to uh, Dr. Lu Yi, uh, I mean, on behalf of the other uh, uh, elbow surgeons who are interested is something like this. Dr. Lu Yi is a very dedicated uh, elbow arthroscopist in Beijing. I mean, his hospital is the biggest. So I'm sure he's going to have a huge experience on elbow arthroscope. But what you would like to, what I would like to ask you is how many elbow arthroscope we need to have a competent level of uh, arthroscopic elbow surgeon. I mean, oh, how so, many surgeries yeah. should we do to reach a certain level of the elbow arthroscopist? Thanks, it's a very, very, very brilliant question. Uh, my answer is, I think the number is very important and timing is very important for the elbow surgeons. If you uh, spend five years to do 50 case, it's not enough. So I suggest if possible, I know uh, sometimes impossible, but if possible, uh, gather patients as much as possible and uh, practice yourself in short times. Uh, usually 50 cases uh, in half a year, maybe you can improve your skill very fast. But sometimes, you know, free body and uh, some small case, you can gather together. I, I totally agree because uh, we, we have to confess that the uh, stiff elbow surgery, if you try arthroscope in the beginning, the most common complication you are facing is inadequate surgery. You can really release the whole pathologic structure within the uh, elbow joint. So in the beginning, you have to accept sometimes you have a low threshold to open the elbow after arthroscopic uh, partial synovectomy. That will help your patient. So as you have more experience, as you said, it's time dependent density, how many surgeries in a certain period of time, then you can establish a certain level of uh, arthroscopic release with reliable results. Thank you, Louis. Great, great. I totally agree with you, Yeho. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lu. It was a pleasure to host you here from China for a very insightful lecture, something we are not very well versed with arthroscopy of the elbow. So we move Thank on. You. Thank you one, once again. Thank you very much, Dr. Lu. Thank you. So we move on to. <clears throat>
So we'll move on to the next lecture, which probably is a very important lecture for people like me who don't do arthroscopy. And it's an open surgical management of stiff elbows. And to you, it is presented by Dr. Takuro Wada, a well-known name in this surgery. And he's a, a huge uh, uh, elbow surgeon from Japan. He has graduated from Sapporo and he uh, has been served on the board of directors of Japanese Elbow Society, and he's an internationally acclaimed upper extremity surgeon. So over to Dr. Takuro Wada. I think we have his presentation recorded also. You, uh, Dr. Wada, you want to play from your end or we should play? Uh, it's, uh, no, it's pretty recorded. Pardon? But I need to move that this needs shared. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure, have for some. Pedic society. Regarding operative procedures for stiff. However, Open debridement or orthoplasty is still a useful and promising option. The purpose of my talk is first to present operative procedure of open debridement or orthoplasty using posterior medial approach. Second, to review operative results. Third, to discuss indications and usefulness of the procedure. Fifty-six-year-old construction worker complained of right elbow pain and stiffness. Extension was minus 70 degrees and flexion was 100 degrees. Radiographs showed osteophyte formation in the coronal fossa, coronal process, olecranon fossa, olecranon, and radial head as well. 3D CT clearly shows location and size of osteophytes and provide useful information for operative planning. Look at the olecranon. Osteophytes were formed not only on the tip, but also by lateral size. Preoperative range of motion and anesthesia. Very small arc. Skin incision. Left photo shows posterior medial skin incision, that is between the medial epicondyle 
and reclinum. An additional lateral scan incision corresponds to that of Cohill's lateral approach. First, the ulnar nerve is identified and is protected for further transposition. The posterior oblique bundle of the medial collateral ligament and posterior capsule is resected. Posterior medial aspect of the joint is exposed. Osteophytes of olecranum, trochlea, and oregonophosa is resected. Then I'm moving to anterior medial exposure. The flexor pronator origin is released from the medial epicondyle. Anterior oblique bundle of medial collateral ligament is preserved together with humeral head of flexor carpi analis. The anterior joint capsule is resected, and osteophytes of coronoid, coronoid fossa is resected. By posterior medial approach, medial side of the elbow and lateral side of olecranum and olecranum fossa can be exposed. Resection of osteophyte can be accomplished. These are cadaveric bone of osteoarthritis elbow. Osteophytes are formed not only on the tip of the olecranum and coronoid, but also on the bilateral side. Resect osteophytes widely. You can see osteophytes of the medial coronoid under the anterior oblique ligament. To get a better fraction, you need to reject these osteophytes. Then goes to lateral exposure. Lateral collateral ligament is preserved together with the extensor origin as a clam. The anterolateral and posterolateral joint is exposed. Osteophytes of radial head, radial fossa, Capturum and olecranon is resected. Osteophytes rejected from the joint is shown. Interoperative range of motion. Compare to perioperative range of motion. Osteophytes are cleared. Postoperative management. One to two days, suction drain is removed. By one to two months, active and assisted ROM exercise is performed. Stretching under gravity is useful. The point is to avoid violent passive range of motion exercise. Changes of range of motion of the patient. Two days post-op, gentle ROM exercise started. By three months, he could fit top bottom of shirt and wear necktie. Post-operative Results. Thirty-three elbows of thirty-two patients with primary osteoarthritis of the elbow were included in this study. Thirty-one patients were male, and only one was female. An average age at the time of surgery was forty-nine years. An average follow-up period was ten years. The follow-up period was greater than 10 years in 19 patients. We evaluated the patient with JOA elbow score, pain score, patient satisfaction, occupation status, and recurrence of osteophytes. Preoperative JOA score of 60 points was improved to 82 points postoperatively. 
Regarding pain score, 12 of 33 elbows were moderately painful preoperatively. At the latest follow-up evaluation, 28 were not painful and 5 were only mildly painful. Patient satisfaction. 87% of patients satisfied with the operative results. Occupation status of heavy manual workers. Preoperatively, 25 patients were heavy manual workers. One year after operation, 19 patients returned to their previous or equivalent jobs. At the latest evaluation, 16 patients were still involved in heavy manual works. Total, 9 patients retired. Reason for retirement was elbow problems only for 3 patients. Range of motion. Extension was improved from 31 degrees to 24 degrees. Flexion was improved from 101 degrees to 118 degrees. On the long time follow-up, osteophytes recurred and extension was gradually decreased. However, flexion was maintained. Discussion. The slide shows operative results of open developmental arthroplasty in the literature. Gain of arc is around 30 degrees. The slide shows operative results of arthroscopic development. These results were not too bad compared to arthroscopic development. Risk and benefit of development arthroplasty. Compared to arthroscopic procedure, Open procedure is invasive, need long time rehab. However, surgeons can get through complete release, watching nerve under direct vision. Durability of range of motion seems to be better. Indication of open procedure would include falling. Patient is over middle age, Heavy manual workers, chief complaint is stiffness rather than pain, and revision cases. In conclusion, open procedure would be still a useful and promising option for stiff elbow. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Vara. A very uh, can you can we have the lights? Yeah, so this is um, open for questions. Uh, Even the foreign faculty, which is online, they can. Yeah, Dr. Can I... Raksha, you can. Yes, uh, Dr. Vara, that was a very nice uh, and very succinct presentation. Uh, if I may ask a few questions. Uh, if your patient cohort, if they had more pain than stiffness, would you go for this procedure? And would you do something similar? for post-traumatic stiffness, which is what we very commonly encounter uh, in my practice. So is this a similar approach that, would, that you would use for post-traumatic stiff elbows as well? And if your patients had more pain than stiffness, would you change your plan to, let's say, an arthroplasty or even an interposition if the patient is uh, early middle-aged and doing heavy manual work? Thank you. Um... In my practice, I operate the, most of the patients arthroscopically, almost all. So in specific case, I choose 
open the bra open procedure. So uh, as you say, post tra traumatic cases, and this case has uh, adhesion might be adh adh adhesion in the joint and the space is narrow. I would choose open procedure, but basically, I I prefer arthroscopic procedure. Thank you. And if what if your patients had more pain? Yeah. Uh, than stiffness. Yes, it depends on the uh, situation, but if the pain is dominant, I prefer uh, arthroscopic procedure. Thank you. Yeah, similar question for Dr. Weda. Uh, I know you are very experienced both on the open technique and as a technique. So is there, uh, due to your experience, is there a difference between the primary OA patients and the other uh, arthritis patients for the long-term result? Is there any difference or is that just similar? Yeah, I think it's uh, no difference between the uh, primary patient and the arthritis patient. Yeah, but, but I, don't, I have I don't, just experience, no, no evidence. Okay. So how what? about your rehabilitation program? Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I just want to know the detail of rehabilitation program if you do the open procedure. Do you use CPM or any other uh, facilities to promote uh, range of motion? Um, in early cases, uh, I used CPM, but I stopped doing it. So now I using uh, uh, so just a range of uh, um, passive assisted and active range of motion, and stretching is very important. So just avoid uh, biolite aggressive range of motion exercise. That's the point. Okay, so you think CPM is uh, not very helpful, right? Yeah, right. I think so. Okay. okay. Professor Wada, thank you for yes. your talk. Can you hear me? Sure. So, you know, when you do a release for an OA patient with osteophytes, it is more rewarding and more predictable. When we are doing it here for post-traumatic arthritis, there is often heavy scarring, adhesions, and the cartilage looks unhealthy. Now, in such patients, when you're doing a release, I often do collateral approach. You have to release extensively, and at times you have to even divide the collateral ligaments. And then I have had to put a dynamic X fix to keep the joint distracted and start movements with the fixator on. So I saw in your slides, you try to preserve the collaterals, which is fine. But in your experience, do you release the collaterals as well? And if so, do you then reattach it distally or try to go back to the isometric point? That is number one. And number two, sometimes in these trauma patients, the joint is so badly scarred and it looks unhealthy. You almost feel you should be doing an elbow arthroplasty. So have you changed tack on table and said, look, this is too extensive and now let's do a total elbow or at, at stage two? Yes, um, this is a very important question. And compare between the primary osteoarthritis and traumatic cases. So uh, the result is worse in traumatic cases. So, uh, so you need to uh, discuss patient and inform that before it. And the ligament, I try to preserve the ligament as, as possible. But, and, but in some cases, uh, it go away. But the, in this case, I reattached the ligament. Um, but there is no problem between the, no instability of that. But I, I don't have experience between the reconstruction or reattaching something like that. Try, I, I'll try to preserve the ligament as possible. Thank you. you Dr. Ashe. Have one comment. Oh, sorry. One last question from Dr. Ashe. Dr. Lou, you want to ask a question? 
Dr. Lu, you were. Uh, yeah, it's just one comment. Uh, I think uh, sometimes I totally agree with Dr. Wada. Sometimes you have to sacrifice uh, both uh, medial ligament and the lateral ligament. We all know the anterior uh, bundle of the medial uh, MCL is very important, and LUCL is very important to keep the stability of the elbow. But sometimes, in some very difficult case, you have to sacrifice that. But you have to reinsertion the ligament uh, to the humor side after your release. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> otherwise <laughs> your elbow become very flexible. <laughs> yeah, yes, that's right. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wara. It was a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, we hope to see you more in future probably in Mumbai itself. Thank you once again. I hope uh, you can have a good night's sleep. You have to keep awake. So uh, we move on. Uh, we have with us uh, our Dean, Dr. VK Sashindran. I request him to come to the dais. We are thankful to him for providing us this beautiful hall. He is an avid scholar and a, uh, and a dynamic leader. We have got him recently in our position as Dean of our medical school. I request Dr. Rajesh Gandhi, our president of Bombay Orthopedic Society to felicitate him. Dr. Sushindran is a, uh, he has uh, come to us from Armed Forces Medical College. He has held various positions, uh, academic positions and uh, retired as professor. Now he's with us as a dean. He's an enigmatic leader. He's a avid cyclist. And a, I request him to give a couple of words. Thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to address this gathering. Uh, I'm very pleased that you are having master classes of this quality because I think there's a great way to educate people and expose them to techniques all around the world. And the talk which I heard, of, of, of which Dr. Wada gave was really interesting and eye-opening. Uh, I'm grateful that you, you made it possible. And I think Bombay Orthopedic Society is doing a great job in furthering education. Thank you. Rajesh. Dean, Dr. Sashidharan. My colleagues, thank you very much for being over here personally in a physical format to come down and listen to all the talks. Now, Master Series has been a, one of the flagship events which has been conceptualized a few years back. The purpose of that was a dedicated one particular topic to discuss it threadbare and to the core. So that is what has been the purpose, and we are trying to do that. I sincerely thank the DY Patil administration and Dr. Sashidran in particular to allow us to host it over here. It's a wonderful auditorium, and we all are learning a lot from all this master series. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, so, we don't have any tea break. Um, uh, you can all go out and take your tea and come back because we are short of time. So we'll move to the next session, which is on inst uh, instabilities. So we have with us. Oh, no, we have one case pending. I call upon Dr. Sachin Kale, who is our own professor and unit head in our department, to present a, a very interesting case uh, of trauma elbow. So we have the foreign faculty to also share share their experiences in such cases. Dr. Sachin Kale.
Thank you, Sanjay Dhar, and thank you, BS, for giving me the opportunity to present the case. So, sir, आगे कुछ So I'll start with the case. My case was 30 years old male patient, right hand dominant, hoteler by occupation, had an injury of road traffic accident five weeks back, and this was roughly in the first wave of the COVID, and he was COVID positive when he presented in the private hospital, and maybe they have done a treatment first for the priority of the COVID and then given a slab, and the patient came to us after five weeks. at the presentation of the five weeks when the patient presented he had a pain and deformity there were wound around 2 uh, by 2 cm on the lateral epicondyle and 3 uh, by 2 over the olecranon there were no active signs of infection this wound were were superficial and there were visible arm and forearm wasting the uh, flexion deformity was 32 to 60 degrees excellent presentation as you see there was a dislocation and the lateral condyle was comminuted multiple pieces and the epicondyle was fractured middle epicondyle was fractured on further investigations we can see that anti dislocation of elbow middle epicondyle fracture epifacial metafacial lateral condyle fracture and uh, the intraarticular component was also there the trans olecranon fracture was there trans trochlear sorry trans trochlear fracture was there so what were the problems if you see this slide so there was a patient who came to us 5 weeks old injury wasting of arm and forearm muscles the wound were two wounds were present multiple scars were there dislocation epicondyle fracture lateral condyle comminuted fractures and if you see the intraarticular component trans trochlear fracture were multiple pieces and shell like so this i want to just discuss this case with the forum or with the faculties so this is open for discussion we uh, the problems uh, what he is facing is A neglected anterior dislocation of the elbow, coronal articular fragments, yeah. lack of bo good bone stock. So the dilemma was what to do about these cases. So this is open for Dr. Parag, Dr. Inho, <coughs> John, for any comments before we proceed. What we have done, we have. Yeah, Parag sir. Uh, we have already dealt with this case. We will share that. So first of all, I think uh, you know. I, I think when you think you've seen all, and then you see uh, some cases like this, you know. So I I am yet to see uh, an entry dislocation of the elbow. I I haven't seen uh, a fracture dislocation like this. Number one, uh, obviously it's it's a shame, uh, and unfortunately we've all had massive. loads of neglected cases you know during the waves of covid there is um, probably no uh, neurovascular uh, injury especially in a situation like this uh, i think the way to proceed would be to have, have an extensive uh, uh, the elbow back in position now he has had a lateral uh, condyle fracture which obviously would have the attachments of your extensors along with the collateral and uh, from what i see here there is probably something going on here medially which i think probably is a bony version of your uh, med collateral ligament as well uh so for me again my go to approach for all these uh, are extensive posterior and uh, this is the style posterior approach and as uh, some elbow surgeons have said before that the front door to the elbow is at the back so i probably do that uh i've for a very long time uh for indication 
done in extensile midline triceps split approach to really expose the entire fish uh, and have access to the entire joint from the back. So I think this is uh, what I would do in this case as well. And uh, release that uh, electron in on the medial side, which in itself might be difficult with the really altered anatomy. Uh, I think once you open this, you should be able to uh, reduce the elbow in this fashion. And then I think perform uh, the osteosynthesis of the lateral condyle as well as uh, the medial uh, evulsion uh, with uh, screws, anchors, uh, a plate, you know, I think you keep everything ready in your armamentarium and uh, and do that. And at the end, depending on how stable it looks, you may add uh, an external fixation uh, to protect what you have done. Uh, maybe static initially and then, uh, you know, dynamize it to uh, initiate range of motion uh, in the in, in the post-op period, depending on how stable the elbow is and how well it's healing. Now, these are the cases which uh, I believe are also prone to uh, heterotopic ossification, uh, and uh, I would add uh, some prophylaxis in the form of uh, endomethacin in this case. So this is how I would approach this. Thank you, sir. I would be very interested to know the Dr. Gion, you have opinion of everybody else as well. Can I talk? Uh, can I start my comment after Dr. Iman? Dr. Iman Aminata has uh, some comment on this complex case. Okay. Okay. From okay. Dr. Experience. Iman, yes, we have not heard you so far. Uh, thank you for inviting me. So, uh, yes, it's a very difficult and complicated cases. Um, I think if this is my case, I would do. Uh, medial and lateral approach. I would not do the uh, posterior approach. Uh, why I choose that? Because uh, actually I would like to see more on the anterior part of the elbow because it's been a few weeks after the uh, incident. Usually there is a lot of scarring there. So I need, sometimes I need to do release and also, uh, I prefer to do uh, uh, medial and lateral, so I can wh when I when I do fixation, uh, when I reduce the lateral condyle fractures, I would like to see the articular uh, side clearly, which is uh, uh, in my my opinion, I would not able to see more clearly if I just do it from posterior, so. My goal is I, I would like to, to reduce the lateral condyle uh, as good as possible in the articular surface. I do not care so much about the metaphyseal, uh, metaphyseal part. As long as I have a good cartilage uh, uh, level, then I'm happy. And regarding the ligament, uh, usually, if you have a fracture, the ligament is well attached to the bony fragment. So once we fix the medial and lateral condyle back to the humerus, uh, the elbow becomes stable. And if I do medial and lateral, I preserve the tricep and the bicep uh, dynamic contraction. Uh, in my case, they help me with, uh, to stabilize the, the elbow after surgery. Uh, in Indonesia, we don't have dynamic stabilizer, so I try to preserve as much as a, a natural stabilizer from the elbow. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Jian? Can't hear you. Unmute yourself, sir. You have to unmute, Dr. Jian. Okay, sorry. Uh, Dr. Sachin, I came here to learn from you, actually. I'm not sure whether anybody has the right answer for this case, but uh, you know, 
we have to pray for this complicated sad case first if you ask me my imagination i would first ask myself what i can do for this elbow neglected chronic elbow dislocation with fracture so if i were in your situation i would do a posterior approach release the ulna nerve and assemble this fracture fragment first and then we'll try extensive soft tissue release whether we i can do a proper olohumeral radio capitella joint uh, articulation so if steel soft tissue is viable then i will try to restore the medially mcl laterally lucl so that at least i can have a kind of a sling of the olohumeral articulation first so uh, I probably will attempt a staged surgery, fracture fixation first, open reduction, maybe soft tissue procedure later on, uh, step by step. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sachin, I have a question for Dr. Vara here. Uh, in this case, um, it's like a neglected old, which is a stiff elbow, plus there is a lot of articular comminution, there's a lot of bone stock which is comminuted. So besides reconstructing the bone combination, as Dr. Iman also said, anteriorly, there was a lot of tethering, there was a lot of short uh, contractures. So how much release would you prefer in such cases as it is an open surgery anteriorly because we are approaching posteriorly. So from you, I want to know that what would be an adequate release in such cases which are neither very old nor very fresh? Yes, um, yeah, this is a very <laughs> difficult cases. So um, the patient, if the patient is old enough and the, something like uh, the patient may be a sign of an infection. So uh, there is no, uh, no sign of infection. I would uh, do a total elbow arthroplasty, but, in, but she's too young. So uh, first I would, uh, do a soft tissue release and and remove this scar tissue and see the fragment and yeah as uh, Dr. Jun said and uh, if the fragment is viable and no sign of infection I would uh, ROF and external fixator and in the second stage. I would uh, soft tissue uh, re reconstruction. Yeah, uh, it's a very difficult cases. Thank you, Thank you sir. Sachin. So absolutely, the, all the faculties are told the same thing. Roughly, we went ahead and uh, we went posteriorly. The plan was to first reduce the elbow, then fix the intraarticular fragments, and then <laughs> Uh, fix the lateral column and then the middle. So our plan preoperative was that fractures were intraarticular. So we put the headless compression screws also suture anchor for the middle epicondyle and for the lateral side we planned for the plate. So as we see in these slides, we disimpacted the articular fragments. First reduced, I, but obviously we went first uh, posterior approach. Triceps were elevated. The dislocation was we were able to achieve a reduction properly of the elbow. And uh, then we went ahead and uh, disimpacted the fragments. And then for the intraarticular components, we wanted to put a headless screw as a, our plan was, but the intraarticular fragments are very small shell like. So then we, our intraoperative, we decided to pass a multiple K wires, like a cantilever technique. And we passed multiple four, five wires. And on after that, that as this cantilever technique says, they're passing one multiple wires, one side of is horizontally not supported, and at that junction it supports. So passing at least five, six, four, five wires intraarticularly, and these wires were buried on the lateral pillar plate. For a middle epicondyle, we were first uh, able to achieve the reduction, but not satisfactory by the suture anchors. Then we went ahead and did the with the help of the K-wires and TBW principle. This was the CM peak. As in this uh, CM peak, we were able to uh, achieve little uh, good articular congruity and also able to achieve the lateral column fixation and middle epicondyle with a TBW. This was the immediate post-op X-ray where we see the 
uh, articular surface well aligned. This was the X-ray after the eight months when the fractures are started uh, consolidating healing and consolidating well. This was after the one year. So the range was around 20 to 120 degrees. And interop also, sorry, I just forgot to mention interop. We were quite satisfied with the stability of the joint and the ligaments. So this was after one year follow-up. And this was the pronosupination moments. The supination was completely, the pronation was restricted. So we, as this was some unique uh, technique which we use for the uh, fixation of the intradural component, the multiple cantilever technique. We, uh, by this case, we recommend that this also is the one of the methods to, for the fixation of the fracture of the intraarticular. We publish this in the PubMed. Thank you. Any comments before we go to the next talk? Dr. Sachin, it's absolutely amazing. I learned a lot from your case. So was it very uh, uh, reducible? First, the question is, was that fracture was very easy to reduce? And what about your soft tissue released front and back? How did you manage that dislocation? So regarding the intraarticular component, there were multiple pieces because that's what we planned for the intraarticular Fix it, uh, the pieces were like shell like so we uh -huh. planned first two but we were not able to so that's the reason we passed the multiple k wires and the, this cantilever technique regarding the soft tissue release there were fibrosis which we were able to remove we released not so much but as the stability was good on the intra things so we did not did much uh, release sir, of the soft tissue but uh, definitely that uh, um, mild release, especially for the reduction and for the disinfection of the fragments, we did the some release, but not the much release. Great, great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sachin. So uh, we move on to the next um, session which is on instabilities. Uh, I invite Dr. Prashant Kamble. <clears throat> Dr. Prashant Kamble is an assist assistant professor at our own GS Medical College, KEM, Mumbai. He is also a very avid elbow surgeon. So I invite him for his lecture on acute elbow instability, clinical radiological assessment. Dr. Prashant. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Bombay Orthopedic Society and organizers for giving me this opportunity. So I'm today I'm talking about the acute elbow instability, uh, clinical and radiological assessment, and what uh, things one should not miss. So in order to understand the instability, one must thorough with the anatomy and biomechanics. We'll go through some examination manoeuvres, some imagings, and you may be able to diagnose those instability patterns. So as previous speaker talk about the uh, primary stabilizers, the uh, lateral collateral ligament complex, medial collateral, and the osseous anatomy with the coronoid and the olecranon. The secondary stabilizer, although the name is secondary stabilizer, they play a very important role once the primary stabilizers are torn or ruptured in case of trauma or injury. So the common flexor also contribute as a dynamic uh, stabilization to the joint. Out of this, the uh, 
ulnar part of the lateral collateral ligament, uh, restrain the varus and posterior part, and the intermedial collateral ligament restrain to the varus and valgus in extension. So how do we evaluate all those patients? Always now look at this X-ray, that small bony fragment which is coming in distal part anteriorly. We don't know from where it is coming, whether it is from the radial head or is it from the uh, coronoid. So always ask for the CT. CT always help you. So it indicates, uh, so if you can see the CT, it's impacting in the distal part of the uh, distal humerus. Uh, you can rotate, you can have exact configuration, how much is the fractured and where from that bony flakes or the bone parts are coming. And of course, you can subtract the unwanted part and you can have the exact anatomy of the uh, fracture configuration and it will help uh, how to treat what implant to choose and how to proceed uh, for the surgical intervention. So theoretically, simple elbow dislocation uh, are those which are uh, without any bone injury, simple uh, pure ligamentous failure, as you can see in the case, but those complex fracture dislocation, they are with the ligaments plus bone uh, fractures also. So it indirectly indicates either you have to repair uh, the bone, either ligaments and the bone or both together. So look, have uh, one case. Uh, she is a nurse at our hospital, had history of trauma, presented to ER, close reduction done under anesthesia, taken through full range of motion, elbow was stable. Uh, so treated uh, conservatively with the plaster cast. And this was the X-ray at uh, three weeks, completely healing, stable and full functional uh, is achieved. But when it comes to the uh, complex uh, acute instability, as I said, uh, it can be a fracture with the ligament ruptures. So either it can be associated with the coronoid fracture, terrible triad, or the, some of the Montage variant and some of the trans oligonal fracture dislocation. So let's have a look to each of them. So the group uh, from the Amsterdam uh, University, uh, Melima et al, they have uh, published the heat mapping of the coronoid fracture. And this subclassified then to the dislocation injury and the disruption injury. I'll tell you why this is important. So here is a dislocation of the joint with or without radial head fracture or with or without coronoid fractures. Another trans coronoid fracture uh, which correspond to the uh, basal type of fracture of the order is called classification. Some of the Montagia variants, anterior or posterior dislocation, or the virus posteromedial instability, which corresponds to the type 2 uh, uh, fracture, uh, the uh, coronoid fracture of the order is called classification. So let's have a look at the most common. Uh, type of instability that we see is a posterior lateral rotator instability. Uh, mechanism of injury described by the odorous call, vulgus, supination, radial head hit against the capillum, goes posteriorly in, and dislocated. So here is a case, young male had history of fall from the bike, uh, elbow dislocated. You can see there is a small uh, flex of the bone in uh, dislocated part but not, uh, so he presented to us with the MRI and showing some cartilage injury as well. So under anesthesia, you reduce the joint, check throughout the range of motion, do the virus valgus test, see whether it is stable or not. Once the reduction is done, you take him through again, complete range of motion. So this is the fluoroscopic uh, uh, image. You can see once I start extending the elbow, it start dislocating at 90 degree. You can see there is joint increased joint space and start uh, dislocating. So I stop that. So that indicates a, a unstable in elbow and that needs and surgical intervention. Another case had a history of fall from the bike and uh, dislocation. And, but while shifting from hospital to uh, from the site of injury to the hospital, patient say it was reduced while shifting and he started using the uh, elbow without any further treatment. But he reported to us within a couple of weeks time and saying that he is having problem while they're lifting the bags and is not able to do what previously used to do, like strength is decrease. So on examination, range of motion looks perfectly fine. But when he was tested for the posterolateral 
drawers test here you can see some of the residents here so i'll just quickly describe how do we do it hold the distal part with the hand and another examiner hold the proximal part of the uh, forearm and try to rotate them so don't do immediately get the patient relax and he is saying yes something is knocking against my elbow means he's saying there is something knocking like like this and when i do the extension so you can see there is a clear postulateral instability you can see there is a negative suction effect at the joint and now patient is completely relaxed is allowing me to do it uh, very comfortably so another pivot shift very uh, very uh, painful for the patient unless a very uh, cooperative patient uh, prefer to do under anesthesia moment i do some blade extension the joint is completely dislocated and moment i try to flex this elbow get reduced so it's dislocated and when i try to flex it get reduced so both the test positive so for this case uh, when i did the mri and it was showing the complete rupture of the lateral or uh, lateral collateral and treated with the reconstruction repair of the lateral or collateral another case uh, terrible tried radial head fracture with the chip of lateral condyle but on clinical examination very interestingly there is a pointing index so we operated this patient and surprisingly intraoperative the nerve was lying at a fracture site which was confirmed by the nerve stimulator intraoperatively so this was the nerve lying at the fracture site which was just transposed uh, anteriorly away from the fracture site and the reduce and the fracture was fixed so we went on recovery at 3 months time coming to the medial side uh, again posterior medial rotator instability uh, although not common but you can see those patient was this a uh, patient is a celebrity doing uh, trying to learn the skiing during pandemic time had his to fall and landed into the intermedial facet fracture of the coronoid another case similar patient demonstrating himself the uh, medial instability elbow is dislocated now he is trying to flex watch it carefully at 90 degree joint is getting reduced now again he will extend you can see at from 30 degree of extension to zero joint is getting dislocated he is doing extension joint is dislocated right and again is tried to flex at 90 degree it get reduced so the same patient uh, intraoperatively with just thumb and index finger getting reduced and dislocated highly unstable uh, we repair the mcl and have the good functional outcome so another patient fall from the bike some bony flex at the dislocated olecranon uh, joint is reduced but you can see there is some chip of a bone seen on the medial side did the ct which was suggestive of the isolated mcl uh, flake of a bone avulsed with the and clinical telltale sign there is a lot of bruising on the medial side tested for the medial joint opening so uh, valgus test it's opening the medial joint so keep it simple if you have this coronoid fracture with the radial head these are the postulateral injuries if no radial head fracture watch for the medial side instability that is posterior medial rotator instability so another group where you can see this is a trans olecranon fracture with the dorsal part of the olecranon is ruptured broken and you can see other anterior or posterior dislocation so most of these injury if you fix the bone you, you may not need you don't need to repair uh, the ligament in most of the cases so example transolecranon fracture dislocation so some other surgeon operated with the posterior approach did the olecranon pitting and excision of the head there is large bony fragment which is lying anteriorly not fixed and this was immobilized above elbow plaster 
but when plaster was removed, this was the X-ray. It was dislocated, and uh, although it's showing some union, but unstable elbow. So presented to us, so we did the CT, and which was showing the large fragment of the coronoid, which should have been caught, and uh, radial head should have been replaced, could have been added the stability of the elbow. So we offer him surgery, but patient turned away, so we couldn't operate him. So take home, so know the anatomy very clearly, because if you know, you can, uh, we'll know what is the instability pattern. CT scan is a must, because this will give you idea clearly what uh, bone subfracture from where it is coming and you can have choice of the implant, then all together make you understand the instability pattern and you can uh, treat them appropriately. If you find difficulty, uh, you can always free to call uh, your friend for the help. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. If anybody has a quick question, you could otherwise we move on to the You want to ask question? Yeah, Satish. Was that the intromedial pulses? What was that fragment uh, which was called? So we move on to the next lecture. Uh, we have one more foreign faculty with us, Dr. Iman Aminata from Indonesia. He's also an elbow and shoulder surgeon. He will be sharing with us uh, chronic elbow instability, assessment and management. Dr. Iman, are you there? Yes. Are we going to play the recorded presentation or? If you want, you can present live. You can present from your screen from your laptop. Yeah, Dr. Iman, you can share your screen. Okay. You see my slides? Okay, so can see it. first of all, I would like to say my gratitude to be invited in this uh, very uh, good event. This is actually the first international uh, conference in pandemic years 2022 that I have attended. So in this uh, topic, I would like to talk about the elbow instability. As you know that the elbow stability is a complex interaction between the bony structures and the soft tissue structures. Elbow instability may result in chronic overuse injuries or untreated instability. And the, the instability may affect the lateral or medial aspect of the elbow. In this topic, I would like to say uh, two big uh, topic. One is I uh, said uh, chronic recurrent instability. And the second one is the stiff but unstable elbow. The chronic recurrent instability is, uh, consists of two. Uh, I think it has been discussed uh, with the previous speaker. One is the PLRI, and the second one is the varus posteromedial elbow instability. 
So in PLR, actually it's a disruption of the LCL complex and this causing the posterolateral rotatory subluxation of ulna and the radial head. It can be caused by the trauma. It can be associated with tennis elbow or even iatrogenic injury. A special test has been clearly described by the previous speaker, so I will not uh, repeat it again. And in imaging, we can see in the plain X-ray, sometimes we can see the drop sign or we can see a, lot, a slightly subluxation of the radial head compared to the capitulum on the lateral X-ray. Uh, we often see the Osborne correlation, which is represent a serial depression fractures of the capitulum and the lateral condyle. In MRI, we can see more clearly that uh, in the PLRI, the main issue is the torn LUCL at the humeral insertion site. So how we uh, deal with this one is we do a uh, ligament reconstruction. Uh, the idea we reconstruct again the, uh, the LUCL. The most important things we need to consider where to put the point of isometry in the, in the origin of the LUCL and the distal humerus and where to put the insertion site. In GSES has been described that the LUCL origin center was actually about 10 millimeter from lateral epicondyle, while the insertion center was 3.3 millimeter from the apex of the supinator face. The other type of the uh, recurrent elbow instability, I will say it's a virus PMRI, uh, as has been described too in the previous presentation, that uh, it is because of anteromedial coronate fractures with proximal avulsion of the LUCL and ulnar collateral ligament posterior bundle tear. So uh, in the virus PMRI, actually it's not only the bone uh, has been disrupted, but also the soft tissue uh, in the lateral part and the medial part. A uh, CD scan is a paramount. We can see clearly uh, the, the, the bone injury, the anteromedial facet of the coronoid. And also, if you can see patient in the MRI, you will be able to see that, that the ligament on the lateral and also the medial elbow is affected as well. Of course, this condition needs to be treated by surgery. We have, there is an algorithm how we need to address this condition. The first one is we have to uh, deal with the coronoid. We can do uh, the plate fixation or even uh, trans sutures. And then I would go to the lateral side and fix the uh, LCL and check if the, the elbow already stable, I would not go to the medial side. But if the, uh, the elbow is still unstable, then I should go for medial collateral ligament reconstruction. Uh, the other big topic that I would like to share, actually, uh, this is what we call the stiff but unstable elbow. It is mostly because of our old unreduced elbow dislocation or even fracture dislocation. This is mostly come to my hospital. The patient characteristic is usually came because of trauma and they went to the bone setter at their initial treatment because they live in the remote area. In this patient, we have to consider what is the occupation, what are the dominant hand, and what is, what is the expectation of the patient so we can clearly uh, explain to the patient what are the treatment possible for this condition. Before I do a surgery or I, I decide what to do in this patient, I need to do some evaluation. The first one is, of course, the skin condition. I check whether you have an ulceration because of a post injury or even previous surgery. Check for uh, nerve palsy, as has been mentioned by the previous speaker, that they have a median nerve injury. And the other thing I need to check the mobility of the elbow. I mean, usually the patient come is more on flexion or more on extension. And by uh, asking what is the, the occupation of the patient, we can assess what he, he or she really needs, more flexion or more extension. And the other thing that I need to check, uh, the, my, the bicep and the tricep tone, and also I need to check whether the patient has the palmaris longus 
uh, tendon because uh, some patient doesn't have a palmaris longus tendon or hamstring tendon because if I have to do a ligament reconstruction, I would not to be surprised after I drip and I check the patient doesn't have the palmaris longus. For imaging, uh, usually I just do a plain x-ray with a CT scan and less common I do uh, MRI. Why? Because uh, in a stiff and stable elbow patient, uh, usually in a uh, condition that most of the case, the ligament already injured. So I, I don't see why we need to spend extra money to do uh, MRI. Of course, there is a challenge in uh, treating this condition. Uh, one is the anatomical uh, issue that, of course, uh, there has been a lot of uh, muscle and soft tissue contractures bony and kilosing, and even uh, most of the case, the cartilage of this patient has been damaged or at least uh, covered by fibrous tissue. The neurovascular also usually tethered by the soft tissue fibrosis. And there are another uh, issue that we deal in Indonesia is because of uh, we don't have so complete implant and there is a low cost coverage for our uh, patient. So we need to set the goals between the patient and surgeon expectation. And we, I always have to tell the patient that it may be a single or multiple stages of surgery. How do I approach uh, this patient? Uh, in the past, I usually do a posterior approach uh, because it's, uh, I, I was taught it is, it is extensile and quite uh, straightforward. Uh, however, I find when I do the posterior, I, I usually have to release or even uh, lengthen the tricep because of the contracture. And this will cause uh, some of the, uh, my patient has a loss of stability or lack of extension power. And also I don't think uh, in, by doing posterior, I have adequate enough uh, exposure to the anterior side. So nowadays I move to do a double medial and a lateral approach to treat uh, this condition. What's to be done? Uh, first with the soft tissue, we need to uh, identify the ulnar nerve. We can do a decompression, simple decompression or uh, transposition of the ulnar nerve. I usually uh, let the ulnar nerve decide where they want to go. And I need to release all the capsule detaching from the uh, anterior part of the humerus uh, superiorly and also release addition of the anterior muscle, usually up to one third uh, distal of the humerus. The scarred collateral ligament must be released or, or sacrificed and we need to clean the intraarticular fibrosis. With the bone, we have to reshape the core, all the fossa, coronoid, radial head, even olecranon fossa, because usually it is covered by soft tissue fibrosis or even callus formation or osteophyte. Regarding radial head, is depend on what is the condition of the radial head. Uh, in few cases, I have to uh, excise or replace the radial head because in a long-standing dislocated usually the radial head already fused with the distal humerus or even it becomes so soft. So when you, you try to reduce it, it just become like a ping pong ball. So uh, again, when the muscle works, I think I've been described. Uh, the, the point that I would like to share is I nowadays I never uh, lengthen the tricep using a VY or a tongue shape, whatever it is, I do a pie crusting. So in my opinion, I need to have a good uh, still tension uh, at the posterior side with the tricep to hold the olecranon on the trochlear. Uh, so I use now the tricep pry crusting and then a gentle manipulation. Uh, in articular surface, uh, it depends on the, what is the condition. As uh, you know that in the post-traumatic uh, condition usually the cartilage is already uh, unsalvageable so it is nice to say if you can do arthroplasty however in our patient they are too young to have arthroplasty they are hard labor so I don't think it's a good for arthroplasty and they don't have money so what I do usually I use interpositional arthroplasty using a fascia lata 
and then I do ligament reconstruction as needed to restore the stability. Again, how I do to restoring stability uh, by uh, reshaping, actually I reshape the bone and heart, uh, the bone of the olecranon and also the uh, trochlear. So it become like a, a locking hinge. And then if I have to do a ligament uh, so, or soft tissue reconstruction, it's still possible use a suture anchor or most of the case they do they they not allowed us to use a suture anchor so you just use the tendon graft for ligament reconstruction you can do a, a separate medial and lateral ligament reconstruction but uh, again because of the simplicity and also because of the cost i usually use a box loop ligament reconstruction i'm using a palmaris longus or now i even use a hamstring tendon because it's bigger and longer so I can reconstruct simultaneously on medial and lateral side. However, the drawback of this uh, technique, actually you cannot really set the tension uh, 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 between the medial and lateral. So you, sometimes you have to accept some of the imperfection. And my POSO protocol is the same as Professor Wada that I use a, a posterior spleen. I don't have a dynamic uh, external fixator. So uh, second week after post-op, I start to move the elbow with assisted uh, uh, elbow flexion in the sling. And then always do an active assisted motion, never do a passive motion. I would like to share my case, some of the, my case. Uh, this is a female 35 years old with dislocated uh, elbow after 13 months. Uh, because I work in the uh, third referral hospital, so usually they came very late. So in this case, I have to remove, resect the radial head, as I mentioned before, that because the head of the radial is already fused, and when I remove it, uh, the, the head is so spongy. So I have to remove it, and I again, I reshaping the, the, the olecranon and the trochlear, and then I put uh, some suture anchor, two suture anchor to uh, provide stabi stabilization of the elbow. Uh, as you can see, the picture on the left is the pre-op x-ray and the picture on the right is the uh, post-op clinical uh, pictures. Uh, you can notice there's uh, some uh, degree of lack of reflection, but I think it's uh, acceptable for the patient. Uh, another case is 24 years old uh, female. She came a little bit early, seven months after injury with the el left elbow is full in extension. And this is the X-ray. So in this type of uh, injury, we need to list of uh, what are the problem. One, one is uh, this, of course, dislocated elbow. The second is a malunion of the radial head. Uh, the third, and of course, if you have this condition, the, the LCL and even MCL usually torn. And of course, long-standing uh, posterior elbow dislocated, usually you have a contracted tricep. So what I do, I, I have to address all this uh, condition. First, we have to reduce it, the medial lateral. And the second one, I have to re, uh, osteotomize and reduce again the radial head and fix uh, with the mini plate to restore the bony stabilizer of the elbow to prevent from dislocation. The the other thing that we need to do after reduce and fix the bone stabilizer, you can see here, I also reconstruct the medial, uh, no, the lateral collateral ligament. The hole here is the, the lateral collateral ligament. I use a palmaris longus patient. So I also have to de the reconstruct the lateral collateral ligament. And of course, the tricep, I do a pycrass thing. So this is the patient a uh, few months after surgery and she can do a, a almost acceptable full elbow flexion extension. Another case is three years after dislocated elbow. This is uh, one of the most severe condition that I had. The patient came, actually the elbow is already fused. There is no more, no much joint, no much cartilage. So I decided to do again, uh, uh, medial and lateral resect all the ankylosing and because of cartilage is damaged, I have to do interpositional arthroplasty. In this case, I 
try not to do ligament reconstruction, just provide stability by doing reshaping. You can see here the elbow range of motion uh, is good. And you can see I let the ulnar nerve decide where to go. In this case, uh, it go, he, he want to go to the anterior. So this is one year follow up. Uh, you can see the scar on the lateral side. And the patient uh, already have some degree acceptable motion can reach the mouth. And of course, there is still lack of extension, but I think it's acceptable. There is unhappy case, of course, there's not always be happy. I, uh, the, the one that I said is 24 years old male, a hard labor, four years after elbow injury, came for bone setter. It was sent by my ex-resident. So uh, I tried to do the same procedure as before, uh, do osteotomy, do uh, interpositional arthroplasty and and by doing re reshaping of the corona, uh, the olecranon and trochlear, I'm hoping that creates stability. However, post-op, uh, yes, there is a unstable elbow. Okay, the elbow is dislocated even in a cast, even in a cast. So then I go for the second procedure uh, for ligament reconstruction. I use a box loop, use a ha hamstring. As you can see here, the, 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 the owner, we drill the tunnel at the sublim tubercle and also the uh, supinator crest. The orientation is a bit oblique. And then uh, we pass the tendon graph from distal, from lateral and medial. And then we connect them. And this is a three month follow up of the patient. You can see the elbow is still a lack of extension, uh, but uh, he already able to reach his mouth and his head. And I think because of this is just three month follow up, uh, we are still hoping that he, he can regain more emotion. So in summary, uh, I would like to de uh, divide my, my topic uh, to two types of chronic instability. One is the uh, stiff and stable elbow, which is more complicated. The second one is the recurrent instability. And dealing with the elbow instability, we need to list all the problems and plan ahead. All the procedure is a la carte, and I think we need to accept some imperfection in our surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Iman. Any questions? Hello, sir. Sir. Uh, yeah, Dr. Rashi. Dr. Iman, fantastic presentation. Uh, I want to ask uh, regarding whenever you are doing that interposition orthoplasty, at the same time, can you use the uh, fascia for deconstructing the ligament? Part uh, of the fascia. Yes. So I try it once, but I find uh, the because. If you use the fascia lata, I have to fold it into, I usually fold it into three or at least four fold to have a certain of thickness. And I once I try, you no, know, several times I try using that uh, strip of uh, fascia lata and I don't think it's strong enough to hold the, 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 the elbow. Usually when you try to stitch it the, the fascia lata to make a like a tubular, it just gets shredded. It just gets shredded. So uh, I, now I just have to take a palmaris slowest or, or hamstring wrap as a ligament reconstruction. I, I don't like to use the fascia lata for my ligament reconstruction. In your cases, uh, on the long-term follow-up of uh, box loop reconstruction, have you observed that uh, the tendon or the palmaris longus or semi-t for that matter, does it stretch out? Do you experience any kind of a subtle instability after you have uh, used a tendon or you would like to do some kind of a internal bracing along with the tendon, like using a, 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 either a tape or a suture anchor along with it? Or you have to close the, I mean, at the mouth of the tendon when it is coming off of the humor, humerus, at that time you do any kind of a tenodesis over there. Yeah, uh, 
that's a good insight, uh, Dr. Asai. So yes, the drawback of using this box loop is sometimes because of uh, it doesn't have it doesn't have a fix fixation point. So sometimes the, the ligament is uh, wobble. So it can create uh, how can I say the bone tunnel is become bigger. So it, it, the, the the other problem is uh, as I mentioned before that you cannot really set the tension correctly on the medial and lateral side. So now, yes, like, like what you, you mentioned before, now I try uh, to put some suture anchor uh, to fix at the humeral insertion point or even on the distal uh, or in the, in the ulnar side, and then put the sutures as an internal brace again. So yes, I, I do that. Because uh, in the long, long, long follow up, yes, the patient uh, usually they have a good range of motion, but not uh, as stable as if you have a good uh, ligament uh, reconstruction. So usually they still have a wobble. They cannot do push up, but they can do some uh, carrying a heavy thing. Uh, and the one thing that I would like to share with you also that in post trauma case. Uh, the nature usually help us. They usually try, uh, they usually become stiffer and stiffer again, as uh, uh, Professor Farak said that. Sometimes you have a re-stiffness. So in my opinion, uh, that can help as well to stabilize the elbow. The elbow try to stabilize itself. So we need to, uh, uh, in my practice, I, I ask my patient to come every two weeks at the first two months close follow up because uh, yes, they tend to have uh, more stiffness because uh, one, because of the pain, they, 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 they think uh, they are afraid to move the elbow because they have been traumatized by the previous experience that when they move the elbow, it's pain. So uh, uh, how I do it, I, I, by close follow up, I ask the patient in front of me, I exercise them how to do the elbow exercise and bring their confidence to move the elbow. So that, that's, that's how, how I do. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, if, if I may, I would like to uh, leave a short comment to Dr. Ashe because yeah. his, yeah. his uh, insight was very uh, important because uh, I had the same case with, uh, I had a box loop technique reconstruction of MCL, LUCL together uh, by using allograft uh, hamstring. But the problem is uh, this patient, of course, he didn't really follow the post abrasion, but he came back with the same elbow dislocation in three months. So uh, maybe if you plan any collateral ligament reconstruction in chronic uh, elbow dislocation, keep in mind, you never allow your patient to do shoulder abduction. As long as once you start, once you allow them to do shoulder abduction, you have a significant various force on the lateral side, and this uh, ligament reconstruction is going to be failed because of the overloading and stretching out of the graft. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jim. So, thank you, Dr. Iman. It was a very wonderful presentation. Uh, once again, a pleasure to have you here. I'm sure we'll meet more often. Once again, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I request we move on to the next lecture. I request all of you to stay on because these are some very important lectures, very popular lectures. And besides, we have a beautiful uh, continental lunch at the end of this uh, CME. So we move on to Dr. Parag Shah, who is from Ahmedabad. You have already heard uh, lots of comments and um, from him during the last couple of hours. So he will be going to present his presentation on terrible triad, a very important lecture. And all of us have to face this condition somehow or other. So over to Dr. Parag. All right. Well, uh, thank you. Just uh, uh, give me a minute to, to uh, uh, share uh, my screen.
Dr. Parag, you are sharing from your side, right? Yes, yes, I am. Uh, when I when I am trying to share, it does not bring my desktop, unfortunately. You are using a Mac or Windows? I'm using a Windows. Yeah, so use the first part, na, screen. When you click on share screen, just click on share screen and then first fellow. First part, share screen. Okay, so I'm doing share screen. Then do what you see on the first thing, na, which is written screen, just click double click on that. Yes, we can now. It, now can, it's you, can you get me now? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Go ahead. Okay, can you can you see my first slide? Yeah, you know, just do a slideshow first. Yes, this one. Yes, just do that one. Okay, yeah, now we can uh, see. Am I good now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, go thank ahead. you very much. Uh, and again, at the outset, uh, I would like to thank the uh, Bombay Orthopedic Society for this uh, uh, invitation to talk on this topic. And it's been a fantastic learning experience for me as well so far with uh, wonderful cases. So uh, I'm going to talk about my experience uh, in a little bit of the literature on the terrible triad of the elbow. And uh, again, a lot of this has been um, uh, discussed, uh, you know, during the course of the uh, course, as would be expected. Uh, a little bit of an introduction. Uh, this term was not quite too long ago, and it was described by Hotchkiss, and it was mainly in a book chapter and wasn't actually in a peer-reviewed uh, uh, article, but then it came uh, became popular in the orthopedic culture. So it's been in use since uh, you know 1996 as a terrible triad, as a complex fracture dislocation of the elbow, which involves a coronoid process, uh, as well as the radial head, along with a dislocation. So if you look at complex fracture dislocations of the elbow, again, it has been already discussed, but the terrible triad primarily falls into the PLRV. So it's the posterolateral rotatory uh, injury uh, with valgus uh, and axial loading in a, a supination. So this is a typical uh, form of injury and vast, most, most of the times it devastates the lateral aspect of the elbow. And primarily you have the lateral collateral ligament injury you have a radial head fracture, and you have a coronoid fracture, which is usually uh, uh, the tape or uh, the 50% the, the of the coronoid process. And the other ones are the varus posteromedial injury, wherein you still have a fracture dislocation of the elbow, but the mechanism of injury and the type of bony uh, and ligamentous injuries are slightly different. And then you have the trans uh, ulnar fracture dislocations uh, as well. So here we have uh, the, the triad, which is uh, a radial head fracture, the coronoid fracture, and the lateral ligament injury. And uh, uh, we have to address each of this uh, separately to have a stable elbow. So your, your coronoid process and your radial head, along with your ligaments, these are basically your ramparts of uh, your castle. And once they are gone, then this uh, literally, the, the, uh, the elbow just falls back as it cannot be held in articulation with the distal humerus. And that is why this is a pretty severe injury where even after reduction uh, of these dislocations, it's very you, it's quite common to find them dislocated by the time you get them to the OR uh, because there is just nothing to hold these elbows in place. So again, uh, I'm not gonna go through these because we do know how the coronoid gets injured. Uh, vast majority of the times, it is the distal humerus uh, during the process of dislocation that knocks the uh, coronoid off. Uh, most of the, uh, the terrible triads usually have uh, the fracture in this particular uh, zone, but the deeper it gets or more anteromedial it gets, you get more instability uh, because of increased uh, uh, involvement of the coronoid process. So again, uh, as Asha has already uh, described uh, his uh, the, the radial head fractures, uh, uh, the classification, uh, vast majority of the times we find uh, that uh, these radial head fractures usually are displaced. They're usually uh, comminuted. Occasionally you find uh, a radial neck fractures as well with an intact head. But vast majority of the times in more severe varieties of fracture dislocations, you have a radial head, which is pretty shattered as you see here in this particular case. So managing the terrible triad, uh, the, we must uh, agree to a common goal, which is to have a stable elbow, which can be mobilized early enough. And 
as has been the discussion, it is an it is a joint which is prone to uh, stiffness, and therefore we would want to mobilize these sooner rather than later. And therefore, vast majority of these cases usually end up being in an operative uh, management. Mind you, there are a small minority of cases uh, where after this, after reduction, you have a small fracture of the coronoid. Uh, the radius is radial head is pretty stable and not very comminuted. These are the ones which we can, after an initial period of immobilization, can be managed non-operatively, but they require a close watch uh, to make sure that things are not going awry. So uh, the individual components are the radial head. So we have uh, do we fix them? Do we replace them? Or do we excise these radial heads? How do we deal with the coronoid? And then what do you do to the ligaments? As you know, it's a dislocation. So you do have a fair bit of ligamentous uh, injuries, both on the medial as well as on the lateral side. Uh, this also brings in the question as to what approach do you use to uh, address these terrible triad injuries? Uh, but by far the most common is still the lateral approach. Uh, there are a lot of people who do a dorsal midline approach uh, so that they can go a medial lateral uh, if they need to do that. And then there is uh, some role of an, of, of an additional uh, medial approach if you have uh, uh, an anteromedial fracture of the coronary process or if you have to go medially because of persistent instability. In my experience, most common presentation has been a type 3 radial head fracture with a type 1 or a type 2 coronoid. A uh, vast majority of these can be operated from a single lateral approach. Again, as this is the case in point, uh, there is no doubt about the diagnosis and the severity of this particular injury. Uh, when you open this laterally, I think the, the, the deeper approach is what nature has made for us. So the moment you incise the deep fascia, uh, vast majority of these uh, fracture dislocations will show you what path you have to take. So you, I personally don't bother for the Coker interval or the Kaplan's interval or an EDC split. I just go in by the path which has already been created by the injury. And so as you can see here, these are fragments of the radial head, but there is a significant soft tissue damage. So you just go through that. And vast majority of the times you do find the lateral collateral complex evolved of the, uh, uh, the proximal attachment. These are my steps in, uh, in how I, I deal with this uh, through a single lateral approach. Uh, the moment you, you excise the radial head, it gives you a reasonably good access uh, to approach your coronoid fixation or an anterior capsular repair, uh, which in, in fact it would be when you have a very small tip of the coronoid uh, evolved off or fractured, I should rather say. So this is uh, what you can do now. There are various ways of fixing this. In the, in the front, uh, this is the one that I've used here in this case, is a small uh, 2.8 millimeter anchor. Uh, I like to uh, use metal anchors because it shows off in the x-rays in the post-op uh, period to know if, you know, if it's uh, hopefully still in the place that you left it when you finish the operation. Uh, these come with preloaded uh, fiber wire uh, with the anchor where you can loop across the uh, capsular attachment on top of the coronoid. Uh, at this stage, you don't really tie these fractures, uh, the fragment, because you still want uh, easy access to do what you're doing. So the sequence that I normally follow is to excise the head, uh, put the anchor or even a pull through, as I will describe later on, through the capsule attached to the coronoid piece. Uh, I would replace the head at this stage. Uh, I extend the elbow to about 30 degrees, and this is when I tie down my coronoid sutures. Uh, whether I've used an anchor or whether I've used a pull-through technique at the dorsal aspect of the ulna. And then at the end, I repair the lateral collateral ligament on the way out, which is when I eventually uh, test the stability of my construct. Uh, again, it has been emphasized that overstuffing is probably the most common problem uh, in when you replace the radial heads. Uh, there was a question when Asha was presenting about how do you... Uh, align it with the sigmoid notch because you it literally obstructs your view. But in these cases, when you have a dislocation, it's uh, quite easy to, uh, to make sure that your radial head is articulating well with the sigmoid notch. So it's something that I take particular care of. Uh, if you are uh, uh, 
you know, accustomed to arthroscopic techniques, then uh, uh, it's quite useful to use an arthroscopic knot pusher to tie your knots uh, on top of uh, uh, coronoid once the radial head is already in place because uh, it's actually going to be without uh, visual uh, reference. So you can get your knot pusher right onto the bony fragment. And I think it uh, helps in getting your knots right onto where you want to be. So this is something that can be used, uh, a knot pusher. So this is how uh, it would look on a fluoro. You have your, your coronoid anchor is in place. Your radial head has been replaced. And uh, then you have your final uh, uh, anchor for your lateral collateral and the lateral repair. Uh, this would be the post-op uh, for this. Uh, you may choose to, to immobilize in pronation uh, and then start early active uh, range of motion. Uh, I followed the overhead elbow protocol uh, very soon enough so that uh, there is a gravity assistance to uh, elbow flexion. And hopefully by uh, two to three months, you get a fairly decent range of motion, including good rotations. Uh, again, the coronoid suture technique where you pass a K-wire from the dorsal aspect of the ulna uh, take your sutures through uh, the capsule on top and then bring it out at the back. You can, a, a neat trick is to use, uh, again, an arthroscopic suture passer uh, or some nitinol wires or even just a straight needle uh, with, uh, with a suture at the back of it. And then you can retrieve this through just one uh, uh, drill hole rather than making a bone tunnel because then you can uh, pretty much, uh, uh, you know, use... Uh, uh, an endo button or a disc to tie them at the at the at the dorsal surface. Again, for the record, you can use, but I've never used an ACL jig to do this part of the procedure. And if you use a button like that, you just need one hole, drill hole, and not two to tie over a bony bridge. Uh, I have not had a lot of success, and I don't like to use uh, a retrograde screw for uh, uh, coronoid fractures unless uh, they are through a plate or it's a large fracture at the base of the coronoid where uh, it would have a hole like this. Uh, but, uh, you know, once you have excised the radial head, uh, this is a picture from, from a journal, but you can easily, it can cut through and uh, you can have uh, 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 instability at the end of the procedure. Again, this is another case with, uh, uh, with a fracture of the radial head and a rather largish fracture of the uh, coronoid process. Here in this situation, uh, because the radial head was fixable, uh, we've, we've gone on to fix it with screws and then taken a medial approach to buttress uh, the rather large coronoid uh, fragment and have uh, a couple of K-wires as well, holding it in a retrograde fashion. So we had a, a pretty good reconstruction. Uh, this was his range of motion at about uh, four months. But this guy, as again, we discussed before, developed uh, a radio ulnar synostosis after this operation, uh, although we did not treat him any further for that, but it's not unusual to get uh, heterotrophic ossification after significant uh, elbow fracture dislocation. This was an interesting case. Uh, this was a middle-aged gentleman who fell off uh, in a lift well and had a previous radial head excision some 15 years ago. So uh, this was, the coronoid was mainly anterior anteromedial. I thought I will repair and replace the radial head as well. Uh, but as you can see, even after excision of the radial head, there are arthritic changes on the cartilage. Uh, the radial stump was pretty hard. And while trying to uh, put this, uh, I had an iatrogenic fracture, and uh, which would mean that my radial head did not have significant stability. So I abandoned that intra-op. There are already some arthritic changes here in the front of the elbow as well. But then uh, this was one of the indications to go medially. If you have a larger coronoid piece, this is an extended FCU split. Uh, that's the uh, ulnar nerve and the, that's the uh, extension of the split to the FCU. And this has been fixed in a buttress mode uh, with a 3.5 distal radial uh, plate. As you see, there is nothing here. There are no screws, but this just buttresses the coronoid very well. And you have a nicely congruent elbow. And in spite of the arthritis that this gentleman had, he has continued to have a very good painless uh, functional range of motion. Uh, this was another case, not a typical terrible triad if you look at it from a, a mechanical standpoint because you have a, a nearly intact radial head. But so this would be a varus injury, 
but this is one of those cases where you still have to go medial and lateral primarily because you have a significant lateral ligamentous uh, disruption as you can see here that's a radial head that's the capitellum and this needs to be brought back uh, in its isometric position which has been done with an anchor and then a medial approach has been taken uh, mainly for the fixation of the coronoid process which could be fixed with uh, uh, with a single uh, screw and uh, this was just a locking screw that we used to fix this piece back in position so these are some indications where you might have to go uh, medially uh, and then these are some of the cases where uh, you have to do a dorsal plating because you have uh, uh, an associated ulnar fracture. Uh, that's the significance, uh, significant proximal injury. The radial head is gone, uh, and so is the anterior buttress. So uh, this was done through uh, a postromedial approach to plate the, uh, the ulna and try and hold the piece of the coronoid through the screws here, and then uh, as well as pull through sutures and then a separate approach for a radial uh, head fixation. And this was how he fared initially. And this was a little later in his follow-up. He did uh, end up with about a 20 degrees of uh, extension uh, deficit, but overall had a pretty stable uh, and functional elbow. So this is the standard treatment protocol for, uh, uh, for a terrible triad injury as described in 2004 by the Canadian study group, which was uh, authored by Pew and Mike McKee and Emil Smetesh and Bram King's group. And uh, this is how uh, the, the repair should proceed. Uh, they, they advocate fixation or uh, suture uh, fixation of the coronoid followed by repairing or replacement of the radial head and repairing the lateral collateral ligament. Then you do the sort of the hanging arm test, uh, let the elbow hang against a towel. And if it remains stable, then I think this ends your surgical procedure. However, if you feel that there is still residual instability, then you can go ahead and do a medial uh, approach and repair the medial soft tissue repairs as well. Uh, in my practice, the incidence of going medial is less than five to 10%. Even if there is a significant bruising on the medial side, once the lateral structures are stabilized, most of the times the medial structures heal without a significant problem. However, if it's still unstable, one can still go for an hinged or even a static external fixator. Uh, in general, excision of the radial head in unstable situations will further enhance the instability. Uh, and therefore, I think it's essential to replace the radial head uh, or fix it uh, in a situation of a terrible triad by improving and restoring the radial length and restoring the various constraints. So these are the situations that can happen if uh, they are not treated primarily well, the coronoid is not fixed, the radial head has been excised. And again, this leads to a pretty disastrous uh, uh, instability very early on in the follow-up because of uh, almost no uh, restraints to hold the elbow in position. Uh, this, I'm sure a lot of us have seen these kind of pictures where the radial head has been excised and a transolecanon pin has been put to uh, achieve uh, early stability. But again, this does not really work because in the absence of ligamentous reconstruction, the elbow falls out again when the pin is taken out. Even delayed excision, in my opinion, is not an option. As you can see here, this elbow was put back in position. Uh, somebody deal, uh, excised the radial head after six weeks put him back in a plaster for six weeks. And at the end of nearly 12 to 14 weeks of, uh, uh, you know, various exercises, he's still, he's now stiff and is unstable. So I think uh, there are some things which uh, need to be addressed in a primary surgery and we must do it right the first time. So the absence of the radial head literally detensions the lateral ligament by relative shortening of the lateral column the absence of the radial head also puts the MCL under excessive valgus stress, and this may also affect normal healing. So I think it is imperative to restore lateral stability in a terrible triad injury. There are some salvage situations where this was a dislocated elbow. This was six months uh, in duration. The elbow was fixed in this position, and it was a manual laborer. And uh, we went in to do what we call an internal joint stabilizer. Uh, this is a technique described by Jorge uh, Orbe from Miami, 
And uh, this is in the initial form when he even started doing this as a proof of concept. It is just a bent Steinmann pin uh, going through the center of axis of rotation from the capitellum and fixed with 3.5 screws on the dorsal aspect of the ulna. So this acts as an internal stabilizer. We started to move him pretty early with this uh, in situ. And by about two months, he had regained uh, a flexion to reach his mouth and head and is gradually gaining a bit of extension. So this is a salvage surgery. I'm not expecting him to get a normal functioning elbow, but uh, this, is the, this is the literature, how this has been done. This is basically just a, a bent Steinmann pin in a, in a configuration like that. So uh, now commercially available internal dynamic fixators are available, uh, but we don't have access to them. But this can work as a good salvage procedure uh, in, in presence of significant uh, instability at the elbow joint. Uh, this may be removed between three and six months, and this is how it would probably look once uh, the, the, the whole contraption has been removed. So in conclusion, it is important to understand the injury. Uh, one, I feel that even if it's a small coronoid fragment, I tend to fix it either by uh, uh, an anchor or by pull-through sutures. Uh, the radial head, should never be excised. You may fix it, you may replace it. Uh, and you follow that protocol. Most of the times the results are acceptable. Some loss of range of motion is to be expected, but people do reach functional range. Uh, one thing that needs to be understood is that stiffness and HO are quite common. And I found that especially more so in the Asian or the Indian population. Uh, and these two uh, uh, consist the majority of uh, complications in uh, a terrible triad, and uh, in the literature, the complication and reoperation rate goes on up to 20 to 25%. But I think we can bring this down by better understanding of the anatomy and good primary uh, management of a terrible triad. I thank you for your attention. And once again, thank you for this invitation. Thank you, Dr. Parag. It was a very insightful lecture. Any questions? Yeah, Dr. Jayesh. Uh, this is a question uh, to all faculties also. Uh, sometimes you get a radial uh, head and neck fracture with an impaction. So if you try and fix it, there's going to be a gap uh, which is there below the radial neck. So what do you do if the gap is significant? Do you bone graft it? Or uh, in such cases, what is your management? And secondly, on the ulnar side, suppose there is a lot of comminution in, the, in your olecranon fossa. So how much shortening do you accept? Or uh, what is the management in such case, uh, patients that you do? So I, think I, I really relate to your first question. There is uh, radial neck fractures. A lot of them are impacted. When you raise them, you, you end up with a defect. So, yes, yeah, in, in, if it's an isolated injury in a young patient, I would probably graft it from the lateral condyle of the humerus and put in a plate. However, if it's a terrible triad, my threshold to replace is pretty low. So, because I want to get them moving uh, straight away. So, I would replace that if there is a significant amount of concomitant injury. But if it's an isolated uh, event, then I would probably graft it either with a bone graft substitute or with an actual bone graft from the surrounding. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes, sir. And I, I did not get the second one. I, I am uh, unable to understand the, the second question. If you could elaborate. If in an ulna fracture, which is there, coming okay. to ulna fracture, proximal ulna fracture, yes. sometimes there is a loss at the articular level because of the comminution. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you tackle uh, those patients? Do you try and reconstruct the entire uh, articular surface with those small pieces? Do you sacrifice it? Or how do you tackle them? So in my practice, again, it's not the commonest scenario you get, but you do encounter it, uh, uh, you know, once in every few while. Uh, I try to just preserve them, uh, put them in position, and then just buttress them below with uh, multiple, uh, uh, you know, locking screws or even standard screws from the plate that I'm going to put to stabilize that fracture. Uh, very unusually so, uh, I would uh, probably take an iliac crest graft and uh, uh, reconstruct that part of an articular uh, 
uh, segment. But as I said, I, it hasn't been something that I have had to do very routinely in practice. Uh, can I, I add uh, one more comment to Dr. Uh, Parag? Uh, I think uh, your second question is a very important concept. It's the same as like our uh, impacted uh, fracture of a, a stablum or the patella. For example, if you have any commission or uh, depression, I think it's important to restore the normal coronoid and olecranon arc. Oftentimes the people uh, remove the small piece and make a compression. And eventually what happens is you make a, a shortening of ulnar coronoid arc and eventually that will create post-traumatic arthrosis. So you are quite right. Uh, sometimes you need to preserve the normal arc of the olecranon and coronoid arc. Thank you. I'm sorry, we I, I wasn't able to uh, uh, hear the question. The radial head, which we are using in India, the stem of the radial head is you are quite big. And by inserting into the radius, do you encounter uh, piercing of the cortex or the breaking of the cortex? So I, I gather you, what you're saying is that that you know a lot of these radial heads that we get are like short and stubby with a with a with a short stem, and while you are introducing them, uh, there is a likelihood of some uh, iatrogenic uh, fracture lines in the neck of the radius. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So yes, it is a common problem, and uh, therefore we are working on these uh, radial heads now. Uh, we are getting uh, smaller stems, but they are longer. And uh, so they have a better length fit into the uh, radius without, uh, you know, uh, damaging the walls. So I think currently some of the uh, stems are uh, difficult to introduce, but I think over time we should have enough inventory to uh, look for us to have locally available to sort of uh, get off that problem. I am still not able to hear you, sir. He's saying if the stem is, we might have problem. If the stem is longer, we might have problem inserting them. Yes. So, so yes. Uh, again, you know, uh, either then you can have anatomic stems, but uh, what we are currently working on are slightly thinner stems which have reasonable stability, but uh, uh, you know they will still go into your uh, medullary canal in a straight fashion. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Raji. Thank you, Dr. Parag. It was uh, uh, really nice of you to sit throughout this session from the very beginning. I'm sure Dr. Inho, Jian, and you have been there from the very beginning, and it was very patient of you. So we move on to the next lecture, Dr. Inho, Jian. Uh, uh, Dr. Inho, Jian is a very close friend. He's professor and chief of shoulder and elbow services at Asan Medical Center, University of Ulsan, Seoul. And he's chairman of shoulder elbow committee, CCOT, and president-elect. APOA Hard Hand and Upper Limb Society. Uh, we have been hearing him quite often earlier also, but today he was kind enough to sit throughout this uh, CME and present almost the last lecture. So, Professor Jion. Thank you, Professor Da. Thanks very much uh, for your invitation. It was wonderful to be invited to um, uh, Bombay Orthopedic Society again. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. So today, I'd like to talk about total elbow replacement for distal humerus fracture. So this is my patient who is an 85 year old lady, still 85, but very uh, active. So as you can see in the x-ray, this is not a simple supracondyle fracture. There you see uh, some uh, opening on the radiocapitalis 
joint with which implies uh, soft tissue injuries. So as an orthopedic surgeon, we have an obsession to fix this one. So you probably will think about this uh, plate fixation, but at the same time, we have a concern. What if we have a failure, fixation failure? It's because of her age, because of the bone quality, because of the combination of the fracture. Do you think this uh, replacement would be a solution for this elbow? Yes or no? So let's figure out how we can uh, access this total elbow for distal humerus. So today I'd like to talk about how to maximize exposure, how to manage ulnar nerve, and things to know about implant performance and deep infection and arthroplastic clinical outcome. So first, how to maximize exposure. This is very important for total level replacement. Patients on a supine position, on the arm, on the chest, we need to access medial side and lateral side at the same time. Always the door to the elbow is from posterior. There's a no ideal exposure yet because this is a still debatable whether you preserve the triceps or whether you detach the triceps. So there is a huge debate in a total elbow group of surgeons whether triceps on or whether triceps off approach. Conventionally, it was easier to access the elbow with the triceps off, but now more and more surgeons especially for fracture cases, they prefer triceps on because you can preserve extensive mechanism and you can get earlier rehabilitation. So this is a classic triceps off. As you can see in the slide, you can do a triceps tongue or you can do Brian Mori triceps off approach from medial side or lateral side. This is what I prefer. I do a triceps tongue because I can uh, handle the triceps length a bit. And then this is how we do a triceps uh, tongue approach. Or you can do a triceps on approach, especially if you are very used to a bilateral paratriceptal approach. This is the same concept. You preserve a common, uh, the extensive mechanism all the way to the olecranon then definitely the, the recovery will be easier and earlier. So here's a question. What percentage, how many surgeons they prefer triceps off and how, what percentage they prefer triceps on? So the question is, we have done a, a, a important a literature review. And according to the systemic review, over 40%, most of the studies, they prefer Brian Mori approach, triceps reflecting off approach, and still 25%, they prefer triceps sparing approach. But we have to keep in mind that the, uh, preserving the triceps integrity, same as like your total knee replacement, quadriceps mechanism is important. Same applies to the triceps in a total elbow replacement. So this is the lady who came back to me after total elbow replacements in around five years. But now what she is complaining is that when she lifts her arm, okay, then I cannot hold it there because my hand is banging my head. This is exactly a clinical presentation of a delayed triceps insufficiency. So triceps failure, as you all agree is rather underreported because we surgeons don't test extensive extension power under gravity. So uh, you, you always have to check the terminal extension with the resistance so that we can compare on both sides. So triceps complication has been reported around 2%, but actually it's more than that. And the second issue is how to manage the ulnar nerve. Well, we have to agree that ulna nerve is a major problem for the patient. Why? Patient's satisfaction is much rely on this ulna nerve symptoms. Whatever you do, your range of motion is good, your power is good, but once your patient has ulna nerve symptoms, 
the satisfaction is very, very low. So the ideal management of ulnar nerve whenever you deal with any elbow surgery is very important. But according to the literature, what we have found is about 6% they have ulnar nerve symptoms. So if you do a ulnar nerve transposition, the chance of ulnar nerve symptom is actually less than in situ decompression. But this is literature review. But you need to review your clinical experience whether in situ decompression is good enough or transposition is better. But here's one thing I would like to share with you. Already a couple of uh, speakers agreed. Once you meet any high grade stiff elbow, always decompress, release this ulnar nerve. Otherwise, you will have a higher chance of ulnar nerve symptoms at the end. So, high grade stiff elbow, always do a prophylactic ulnar nerve decompression. So this is uh, something we have to keep in mind when we do a triceps on approach because we preserve the triceps integrity and we manipulate the triceps medially and laterally. And during this manipulation, you oftentimes injure the ulnar nerve. So when you plant triceps on, always release the ulnar nerve all the way approximately distally to the osbon ligament so that your ulnar nerve is free and safe from the retraction of the triceps. So a few things, a few uh, clinical uh, pearls for implant performance related. Two important uh, concepts, technical pearls, implant length and rotation. The humeral length, humeral component length and rotation is important. So if you put the humeral component too deep or too shallow, there's always a problem of the soft tissue tension. So during surgery, you always need to check there's no mechanical impingement and soft tissue tension is good enough. And second, distal humerus is not straight bone. You know, metaphys metadiaphysis, the posterior surface is flat, but if you go down there, you know, at the condyle center, there's a significant component of rotation. So unless you appreciate this uh, rotational uh, component, your implant can get in a wrong axis, in a wrong rotation. This, uh, imply, this applies to the same to the ulna nerve. So let's say you put an uh, ulna component too deep or too shallow. What happens is your coronoid can be impinged with the anterior humeral cortex. Your proximal ulna is not straight bone. Proximal ulna is a various dorsally angulated and internally rotated. So always have this uh, posterior tricep surface as your important landmark. So why we need to have more focus on this alignment and axis and depth because during elbow flexion extension, significant amount of vector goes all the way posterior superior that's why we need coronoid in the front. So let's say your ulna component is very deep. During flexion extension, can you see your big coronoid in the front is actually going to pull this ulna component proximally. So this is a major cause of the ulna component losing in an early phase. So whenever you see any sort of bony impingement, if your component is too deep, always remove anterior coronoid to avoid this bony impingement phenomenon. So this is my patient who came back to me after second revision total elbow replacement because of the cement. I could not remove all the cement, so I had to put a rather a, a short uh, ulna component. But you can see here in the x-ray, the alignment of the ulna component and long axis double ulna is not really straight and there's a, some sort of a mal alignment in the ulna component. So what happens after this surgery, one, two year after total elbow, you can see a very tiny uh, radio loose line around this uh, tip of the ulna component. This makes digester the next day, next year. After revision sur surgery, three years after revision surgery, can you see the huge uh, balloon, uh, ballooning and osteolysis all around the ulna component? So we needed 
and the real revision surgery for this patient. So the proper alignment of the ulnar component and the bone is important. So when do you expect the mechanical failure for total algo? Obviously, there's one important thing. If your patient is too young, too active, total elbow result will be horrible. They usually have landed up with a mechanical failure, early failure. Second, you need to let them know that you should not lift any heavy weight with their operated hand because any weight lifting is going to make early mechanical failure. Third, Trauma-related patients have a higher chance of a mechanical failure than any rheumatoid. So mechanical failure, either loosening or periprosthetic fracture, we cannot deal with a polyethylene wear, but at least the humeral flange in the front, how to avoid the mechanical uh, the bony impingement, this is very important for your survival of a stent. And the, uh, the fourth, the deep infection, because the elbow joint is a very superficial joint, just under the skin, there is a joint. So always deep infection is very, very concerned for surgeons. So how we can avoid the wound healing issues, you always try to minimize the flap so that you make a very thick flap during the surgery so that we can keep the microvascular around the skin. And after your total elbow surgery, please immobilize your elbow, not in flexion, at extension, so that there's a less tension in the back of your elbow. So maybe a vacuum uh, system can help to avoid any uh, superficial skin necrosis. But we have to keep in mind, the survival, survival of total elbow is a significant worse once you have any deep infection. So in an early phase, we should really preserve soft tissue very, very carefully. Otherwise, the total elbow survival is very worse. This is a patient who came back to me, uh, who, who was referred to me after total elbow replacement. You see the skin chronic ulceration. After removing this skin ulceration, it was very deep infected. Again, this patient, after three days, you see the superficial skin necrosis around the skin suture. This is what happens after a extensile soft tissue release during surgery. Because I know this is very superficial uh, skin necrosis, wound issues. So I put the elbow at extension. And then two weeks, four weeks, and five months, skin completely healed but you have to try to avoid any excessive tension in the back of your elbow. So what we should keep in mind for uh, total elbow for distal humerus fracture, sometimes your fracture goes all the way proximally. So you need a longer flange and long stem. Second, when is the best indicated? Obviously it's the same as a radial head replacement and same for total elbow. Any Unfixable fracture because of old age, because of the poor bone quality, because of bone combination. These are all indicated. So what about the total elbow clinical outcome? We have to know total elbow clinical outcome is not like your total knee or hip replacement. The five-year failure rate is a rather high, 15 to 30%. And trauma-related total elbow, you have a more revision rate than rheumatoid patients. So according to Dr. Bako published in 2017, minimum 10-year follow-up, he reported 18%, almost 20% revision rate in the revision, mostly after, you know, ulna component, ulna loosening or ulna component fracture. So this is my last slide, a take home message. Any arthroplasty, the aim is the same. We need to improve pain, quality of life and function. But specifically for elbow, how to avoid a mechanical failure, how to avoid wound complication, and how to preserve the triceps extensor integrity, and how we can avoid all nerve symptoms 
these are four important concepts for successful total elbow replacement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jeon. As always, an excellent talk. Uh, are there any questions? Dr. Ashe, Dr. Parag. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have one question. Uh, what is your view on uncemented uh, elbow replacements? Are you all using it there and do you feel there's any midterm follow-up? Sir, that's a very good comment. Uh, but I would confess that total elbow evolution is a very way behind the com compared to the shoulder and the knee. As far as I know, there's a no uh, uncemented uh, total elbow yet. But probably in the future, we need to think about that. Thank you. You mentioned about vacuum assisted closure uh, for taking care of uh, early wound complications or prevention of seroma. So, uh, do you recommend uh, it like an incisional closure for vac, using vac as an incisional closure during all your elbow replacements? You have started doing it? No, not really. Uh, that uh, vacuum system was a very, very favorite item from Dr. Uh, Mori in Mayo Clinic, but I'm not using it as a routine because now, as I said, once you make a skin incision, your flap should be thick and you can avoid any superficial wound complications. And now I use a less and less vacuum system now, but obviously in the early phase, once you have any sort of discharge and wound Yes, I used to use a vacuum on top of this uh, skin incision. What is your weight recommendation? I mean, how much weight do you allow them to lift uh, uh, after your TE? Um, yes, I would say the maximum is a five kg, okay, five kg. But I don't know how how much they you know really uh, follow my instruction, but. Uh, you, in the early phase, yes, definitely you need to avoid any uh, weight lifting. So, uh, Ashay, uh, I believe your uh, your idea on the elbow is a very paramount, and uh, how we can avoid early failure for this uh, sort of hinge the total elbow is very important. So, uh, you please uh, give us comment how we can avoid this early failure for this uh, for elbow replacement. Uh, we have discussed that uh, uh, asking them to restrict the amount of weight uh, they lift. Yeah. And moreover, your point about the ulnar component loosening because of the coracoid, uh, so coronoid. So that those things, I mean, if we can take out coronoid early, I mean, when we are putting the ulnar component, would that help in preventing loosening on a long run? What, did you, what, what, what are your thoughts? Yes. Uh... Related to the loosening of the total elbow, you need to think about the biology reaction and something on the mechanical reaction. We can really cover the surface treatment, but at least the um, uh, intra-op condition, which you surgeons can control, is this height and torsion. And then uh, I often make a very wrong decision because once you have a no condyle on both sides, there's no landmark to put the humeral component in. Then oftentimes you make a too tight or too loose uh, total elbow, then it can create uh, more problems. So I preserve, I try to preserve both condyle, medial lateral condyle at the same time, but if I cannot fix it, I don't hesitate. I just take out this condyles, but then I do not have any landmark how much I put the owner on. The approximate uh, distal humor stem in. That's a problem, actually. Yes. One uh, technical question. Yes, I saw your X rays. Your design is a spin off from the Kunrad Mori design. Now, you also have an anterior flange which fits at the lower end of the humerus, and you're supposed to wedge in a bone graft. Some of your x-rays did not have your bone graft. And I understand when you put it in, often the graft slips out. So do you have any technical tips how to ensure that the graft remains when you're cementing in the humeral component? 
Yes, uh, we had a very extensive discussion before for total label symposium. Yes, the bone graft is very, very important. But some of the Asian ladies, their tumors is not really big enough and you cannot put bone graft in that flange. Then we just ignore it. Otherwise, I try my best to put the bone graft because this anterior flange is very important for Kunrad Mori total elbow replacement because it's going to resist rotation and posterior directed uh, force. So if you do not have this uh, proper flange, there's very high chance of all that comp uh, uh, humeral component losing. So if you read the literature, it used to be a Kunrad total elbow, but because of that flange, it became a Kunrad Mori total elbow replacement. So uh, we have to really appreciate the anterior flange, and this is not a uh, very, uh, you can uh, neglect it. I try to fix this anterior flange strong to the metaphysis. Yes. Yeah, and uh, one final question from me. So the revision elbow replacements, in your practice, are you seeing all patients coming back with the bone cement interface loosening? Or do you see only the selective bushing wear out with your design? It depends. Some of these patients, they come to me a bushing failure, but bushing failure is an early phase, more young patients. But mostly they come to me with either periprosthetic fracture or loosening issues in a long term. So uh, uh, as you mentioned, the, the bushing wear is very common in more active patients who have to live with their hands they usually come to me with the pushing failure. But more and more rheumatoid patients, they come to me with the uh, periprosthetic fracture using related issues. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Yun Ho, can I ask a question? Hi. Yes, sir. Uh, what, <laughs> what do you think about the role of uh, Hemi for the fracture case? Do you think uh, oh. the Hemi play some roles? Uh, Dr. Louis, unfortunately, still that hemiastroplasty is not really available in South Korea, and I have a very limited uh, knowledge on that. But you are quite right. The hemi for distal humerus fracture is going to be more and more popular, but we always have to know once you replace this distal humerus, the soft tissue tension on medial and lateral side is very important. Otherwise, your ulna the normal ulna can be exposed to a very high loading and you have an erosion of the ulna, which create pain and arthrosis later. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, one more question. Uh, what options do we have uh, after a uh, failed total elbow? Sorry, sir, I didn't understand. What options you have for failed Yes. Yeah. What oh, yes, uh, I do have some patients in my clinic who have five or six surgeries because of total elbow replacement. Because once you have a deep infection with MRSA or pseudomonas, you actually cannot treat it. So agree, some of these uh, low demented patients, you can deal with the resection osteoplasty we remove distal humerus, proxima ulna, and their arm is almost like a, you know, a, a frail elbow. But if you have a five or six surgeries, then they are happy with that. No pus discharge, no antibiotics, and they live with that. I never did fusion yet, but for revision elbow, two things. If it is infected, yes, I need to have a discussion on whether we should live with the resection osteoplasty or after long term of antibiotic treatment, we do a you know, allograft prosthetic replacement. So some patients, they prefer resection osteoplasty. Some patients, they do uh, revision, real revision surgery. So I know uh, in India, you, you don't have a lot of uh, cases for total elbow replacement, but uh, is there still a fusion of elbow viable option? What about your results? If you have any experience, Professor, please let us know. Yeah. Yeah, I personally, I have 
done couple of fusions in last 10 years but not uh, most of them fused but uh, generally it is not an accepted mode by the patient so they would rather prefer an interposition orthoplasty <laughs> Uh, more for the uh, uh, more demanding patients like uh, manual laborers with the early arthritis fusion. Yes, we have done very few, of course, but they they do ask about the range. Yes, uh, that is a very important comment, sir, because now the the very critical uh, area for elbow replacement is how we should deal with the arthritis in young active patients. But in my mind, still osteoplasty is not an option for young active manual workers, whatever their elbow condition is. Because once you finish your elbow replacement, they lose their job and it is not simply your treating elbow, it, you, you change their life. So uh, in that case, maybe uh, that Dr. Louis mentioned that you need to do uh, multiple osteoscopic procedures for them to gain range of motion and pain relief, but they should live with their elbow for a while. So uh, I don't really do a total elbow for young patients here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jian. Thank you. It was a wonderful uh, session. Uh, I think I... Uh, saw you sitting throughout there from the very beginning, very patient of you. So I thank you all uh, international uh, faculty and who have been here, Dr. Jion, Dr. Iman, Dr. Lu, Dr. Parag, uh, for being here. You may leave the, I wish you could join us for the lunch, <laughs> but you cannot. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we will skip case presentations as it is getting quite late. So you may as well <clears throat> leave the meeting. Thank you very much once again to have with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. We will continue with Thank Dr. You. Randy Bindra's lecture. If you want, you can carry on with the Zoom. Uh, since he is not live, we are just playing his lecture. So if you are interested, you can carry on. Otherwise, you may. Have. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye. Thank you very much, Dr. Randy. Uh... So, uh, yeah, why not? Right up, right up. Oh, oh it's a little bit. Thank you. I, uh, uh, I can assure you that this is going to be an amazing event. And so get set and be there with Rajesh and Ashish and Abhijit at the helm. I'm sure it is going to be a fantastic event. And with GeoWorld, everybody is welcome. So we move on to the last lecture. We, you have the choice to, uh, it's a very important lecture. I think all of us treat tennis elbow. And this is from a person who probably all of you know uh, is Dr. Randy Bindra, 
he's the guy who treated Sachin Tendulkar. So uh, you you may as well, the lunch is ready. It is in the adjacent medical college building, Legends Cafe. So anybody who is getting late may go there or you want to go through this lecture. This is going to be the last lecture. So or otherwise lunch is ready. Good afternoon, friends, and thank you to the Bombay Orthopedic Society for the kind invitation to present my thoughts on a very common condition, lateral epicondylitis of the elbow. Lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow is so common that almost 40% of us sitting in this room would have experienced it at some time during either our work or our hobbies. And almost one to 3% of adults are diagnosed as new cases with this condition every year. So the problem lies in the tendon of the extensor carpi radialis brevis. Now you know that the tendon originates from the bone much deeper than the rest of the common extensor muscles and repetitive wrist extension with the forearm pronated puts constant strain resulting in micro tears that never heal properly, thereby propagating this chronic condition. By far the most common cause of elbow pain. And although it's caused, called tennis elbow, the majority of patients that I see in my practice are generally from some kind of repetitive work or manual labor. Lateral epicondylitis from work is quite common. And in fact, in my state, almost 18% of all work cover claims, as much as back pains, are relating to lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow. It certainly affects patients between 35 to 50 and equal in both genders. Most of the jobs are like you can see in the pictures where there's constant gripping and stirring of food or swinging a hammer constantly. Important to remember that about 5% of patients with tennis elbow will have associated radial tunnel syndrome and I will describe how to look for that very carefully. Now, the good thing about tennis elbow and this is something to discuss with a patient is that the majority are self-limiting and get better by themselves. So about 80% will be better. Between six months and sometimes up to two. These are the ones that you may consider some form of surgical intervention. One good indicator that this patient is not going to improve is if they have a very high baseline pain when they first present to you in your practice. If they have a high pain, then they're likely almost five times to keep getting symptoms for prolonged periods of time. Other factors that affect the prognosis in an adverse manner are as shown in this slide, a manual labor, a repetitive type of office work, slightly older age, female gender, tobacco use, and if they have associated shoulder pain from rotator cuff pathology. When assessing a patient who first presents with lateral elbow pain or tennis elbow, very important to document the duration of symptoms, exact details of their occupation, what they do, what's the repetitive task that they do, visual analog score of their pain, and to document their pain-free grip strength. So that is the amount they can grip with the dynamometer before they experience pain. Now, one scoring system that's very valuable, uh, this has been developed by a a therapist in Canada, Joy McDermott, is the patient rated tennis elbow evaluation. And if you Google this term, you will find the form that you can download and use in your practice. Where it is helpful is, and I'll come to that in the next slide, is that patients with a lower uh, score are likely to do better. Those with higher scores are likely to have long-term problems. Diagnosis of uh, tennis elbow is not difficult. These patients usually localize their tenderness to the lateral epicondyle and just about a centimeter distal to that. Mills test is when the pain is provoked by passively flexing the wrist with the forearm pronated and extending the elbow. Also, pronation of the forearm with the elbow extended uh, can elicit their tenderness over the lateral epicondyle. A chair lift test where the patient lifts up a chair with both arms extended and the forearms pronated also causes pain at the lateral epicondyle. In the Cozen test, the patient ext extends the wrist and the examiner resists extension 
thereby reproducing their discomfort and they are tender over the lateral elbow. On 5% of patients with tennis elbow have radial tunnel syndrome. Now this can be suspected when their tenderness is distal to the lateral epicondyle and the pain also radiates down the forearm. Now in these patients, the rule of nines is a useful sign. So you can mark nine areas. So these are small squares or circles that you can draw in front of the elbow. Now the patient with radial tunnel syndrome will have tenderness anteriorly first and second boxes that you can draw just distal to the elbow crease. A patient with median nerve irritation will have tenderness in the middle of the forearm in the second and third distal most box from the elbow. The blue boxes are controlled. So if a patient has pain everywhere else, they're simply catastrophizing their pain and likely don't have radial tunnel syndrome. I find this very useful in my practice. Of course, another good sign of radial tunnel syndrome is the patient experiences pain when they supinate their forearm against resistance and with resisted extension of the middle finger or Maudsley sign. That is generally indicative they may have radial tunnel syndrome, also, although it is also positive in patients with lateral epicondylitis. Those patients with elbow instability may also present with uh, lateral elbow pain. It is useful to do the usual signs for posterolateral rotatory instability, which includes simply subluxating the radial head out with the forearm supinated, or asking the patient to do some dynamic tests such as loading their uh, forearms on a table, lifting a chair from behind them, or gripping the edges of a table to provoke subluxation of the radial head. Of course, the pivot shift test is much more difficult to elicit and generally is done under a general anesthetic. Now, in the majority of instances, no further tests are needed because a diagnosis can be made clinically. So you've excluded some bony tenderness or if you suspect the elbow motion is limited, you may get an x-ray to look for a pathology such as osteoarthritis of the elbow or radiocapitellar arthritis or osteochondritis dissecans. In those patients, you would get a plain x-ray to look for calcification in that area or arthritic changes. Ultrasound is useful as it's a non-invasive test and if the diagnosis is in doubt. Certainly MRI and other tests are only indicated or I would perform them only when I'm planning surgery. For example, in this patient who's had a long-standing lateral epicondylitis, uh, you can see there is some detachment of the lateral collateral ligament. There's a lot of fluid on the lateral side of the elbow and there's changes within the extensor carpi radialis muscle uh, right there. So a positive MRI may or may not help. However, if you're suspecting that the patient does not really have any real pathology, a negative MRI might help as if the MRI shows no changes within the muscle and a completely normal appearing elbow, you may look for other causes for their pain. I've listed here for you some of the other conditions that could simulate tennis elbow. And these include synovial plica that is often seen on the MRI or when you treat these arthroscopically. Elbow instability, radial tunnel are probably the more common things. Uh, occult fracture, generally there would be a history of an injury. Cervical radiculopathy, the pain does go more proximal and more distal to the lateral epicondyle. Capitellar osteochondritis, generally in more younger people and in tennis players should be suspected. Triceps tendonitis, of course, the tenderness is more posterior, and radiocapitellar arthritis is possible, uh, but these patients often have lost full extension of the elbow and would be easily diagnosed with a plain x-ray. When I see a patient for the first time with lateral epicondylitis, I usually will fit them with an orthosis, either some kind of a counterforce brace or a wrist brace in the initial period only to help give them some comfort and pain relief they don't really have much benefit in the long term. So most of the counterforce braces or wrist braces, they do help for improving pain and function for the first few weeks. And it doesn't really matter which type of splint you use. And they seem to be as effective as a steroid injection and certainly don't have any of the side effects such as hypopigmentation or tendon degeneration. However, 
using an orthosis alone is inferior to doing multimodal treatments such as exercises and activity modification. So on their own, using a brace is not very effective. It is useful to help pain in early cases and as part of multimodal treatment. So the mainstay of managing patients with tennis elbow is from physiotherapy. So I will ordinarily refer my patients to the physiotherapist and they will give them a brace if needed. They will start exercises and these could be concentric where you flex and extend the wrist or eccentric where you place the wrist into extension and then the patient slowly lowers the wrist into flexion or isometric where they are strengthening the muscles without actually moving the wrist. Now, sometimes manipulation helps, and this could be both by a patient themselves or applied by the therapist or other modalities such as ultrasound, shockwave therapy, and acupuncture. These are some of the maneuvers that the uh, patient does along with the physiotherapist. Here you can see they've rested the forearm on the thigh, bringing the wrist into extension, and then slowly flexing the wrist down, so doing the eccentric uh, exercises in the initial phase of the disease and then they can start to do concentric where they are flexing and extensing to improve their strength. Another way to exercise the muscles is to hold a hammer and gently prone it and, for, uh, and the forearm uh, and here is a uh, torsional uh, splint that the patient twists with the one arm and then slowly lets go while gripping with the injured arm. Another technique is to apply a TheraBand secured to the wall there and the patient is slowly rotating their forearm and strengthening their uh, muscles uh, around the elbow using that. These are some of the manual uh, therapy techniques where the therapist applies direct pressure over the tender areas and here you can see even the patient can start to do this by gently massaging the area and manipulating the muscles while they're doing the exercises and also as a long-term pain prevention strategy. Taping is also useful, uh, serving as a reminder and also prevents the patient from going into extremes of motion, certainly in the early stages of the disease. I would like to thank Leanne Bissett. Uh, she's written a lot of papers on lateral epicondylitis and happens to be working in the same university as myself. So she has kindly supplied me some of these therapy technique slides and some of the outcomes based on the uh, literature review that she has done in this matter. Now, this looks like a complex slide, but this is from the paper written by Leanne Bissett in the Physiotherapy Journal. And what they've done is they've looked at all literature so far, comparing different techniques uh, compared to placebo here. And you can see acupuncture slightly better than therapy. That's why the arrow points towards acupuncture exercise slightly better than uh, placebo, manual therapy slightly better than doing nothing, shockwave therapy, funnily enough, not as good as placebo where you do nothing, uh, and um, orthoses again, seem to be more or less the same as doing acupuncture, laser, ultrasound treatment. So overall, literature is kind of mixed. The best treatment seems to be multimodal, where you use a brace, do exercises, and do manual manipulation. Here's another interesting slide done by Leanne Bissett where they've looked and they've done a meta-analysis of all papers on uh, lateral epicondylitis with a non-operative treatment. And what, they, what you'll see is if you do physiotherapy, so these patients get better quickly and they remain better with 90% being symptom-free by the end of the year. If you wait and see, so you do nothing, just wait and see, these patients take a little longer to get better. But hey, by about six months, these guys are almost as good as those who've been treated with physiotherapy. And by a year, slightly less than physio, but they seem to get better, which is why most tennis elbow patients gradually get better by the end of the year, regardless of what you do. Most interesting is when you give a steroid injection. So patients who get a steroid injection, great success early on. So just within the first four weeks, if you give them an injection, great pain relief, so they will love you for it. However, if you do nothing else, they will actually drop off by six months and get some degree of recurrence of pain. And then finally, 
at the end of a year, they are better, about 60%, but not as good as the patients who've got exercise. So whatever non-operative treatment you do, it's a good idea to combine the different treatments rather than use one on their own. Here's some guidelines to use. So patient comes with pain over the lateral elbow. You do a good physical exam. No need for imaging initially. If you're convinced that they have a tennis elbow and you've ruled out other conditions, you could then do tests if needed. And you've diagnosed this as lateral elbow problems with tendinopathy. A good test to do is the patient rated tennis elbow evaluation. So this test is based on the pain and functional score. If their score is less than 33, these people are not severely affected they're managing their pain well, they will generally do better with non-operative treatment. Patients who present with really high pain problems from the very start with a patient rated score more than 54 will generally do worse and have a longer term problems of getting control of their pain, getting back to work and higher recurrence. So this kind of helps you prognosticate which patients will do well and which will not do so well. So this a PRTEE -E is a pretty useful test to use for patient evaluation. What does literature say about other treatment measures? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, doubtful if they make any difference, but they do help pain control in the early stages. Platelet-rich plasma, prolotherapy, that is injection of a high concentration of dextrose, nitric oxide patches, all these things have been tried probably don't do much against um, doing nothing. And one of the techniques that's available in Australia, it's an interesting technique where they take a strip of tendon from the patient, multiply the tendon cells, and then six weeks later, inject tenocytes back into the area. Again, there is no prospective study that has confirmed this. There's a couple of case reports, so we're not sure if this works. It's quite a expensive treatment works out to about $4,000, almost the same cost as doing surgery. So which patients will need surgery? Well, if they've tried all the different modalities I've described earlier for at least six months, or they have recurrent problems, they've had it last year, it's come back again, or if you get an MRI because they're not getting better and there's a significant tear in the muscle, more than six millimeters, these are patients who will generally need an operation. And I don't need to tell you who this is and that he suffered with tennis elbow for quite a while and almost uh, stopped playing and had to give up his career at uh, one point. Of all the different types of surgery that are available, uh, the, they could be either open or arthroscopic or percutaneous techniques uh, where the tendon is simply divided. The basic concepts are generally the extensor origin of the ECRB is divided or the path pathological portion of the tendon is removed. Uh, some recommend doing a step lengthening of the ECRB tendon or a denervation of the lateral epicondyle by stripping off the soft tissue around it. Radial nerve decompression would be indicated in the patients with radial tunnel syndrome, about 5% of cases. And certainly if there is evidence of a plica or a fusion within the joint, then making a small arthrotomy at the same time to debride the joint would be along with uh, dealing with the degenerative tendon. Arthroscopic or percutaneous are good techniques, but you need to be good at uh, doing elbow arthroscopy. I personally do open surgery on these patients uh, as I will describe uh, soon. It's important to remember the anatomy of the ECRB tendon when you're planning your operation. So most of us will make our incisions somewhere along this line. Now the ECRB tendon is hidden beneath the muscle belly of the ECRL. So typically you would have to elevate the ECRL muscle belly of the lateral supracondylar ridge to get to the bony origin of the common extensor origin. And this is the part where you'll find the degenerative ECRB tendon. Generally it'll be a long kind of area uh, that will be uh, degenerate, it will have lost its shine, and that whole area needs to be debrided. Two important anatomical points when you're doing this operation. The lateral ulnar collateral ligament, right here, is located deep to the area where you'll make your coker incision and your dissection. 
So be careful not to do sharp dissection and accidentally sever the ligament. This is a known complication of tennis elbow surgery. Also, the ankeneus muscle is got a great blood supply and this muscle, if detached here, is a useful muscle to flip backwards and cover a large defect. I would use this in patients who've had recurrent disease or where there's a significant defect in the tendon or there is subsequent fat atrophy from repetitive steroid injections. An ankeneus flap would be very useful. So this is an operative video. Uh, the patient is Spider-Man, well, not really, but uh, he has pain on the lateral aspect of the elbow. This patient has had tennis elbow surgery previously, uh, two years ago, and the disease has recurred. His MRI shows some detachment of the lateral collateral ligament, as well as degeneration within the tendon. So I've done my coker approach. Now, because of the previous scarring, I've gone more proximal and more distal and elevated the fascia in that area first. The next step then is to elevate the extensor carpi radialis longus muscle. And after elevating that, I'm debriding the degenerative tendon of origin of the ECRB. So you can see I'm cutting down all the degenerative tendon on the underside of the common extensor origin. Now I'm freshening the bone by using a bone nibbler and removing all the degenerative tissue uh, right there. Now the collateral ligament is deeper and I've not gotten to that just as yet. Before I get deep into the elbow, I'm first starting to raise my ankeneus flap. I'm using an ankeneus flap because there is a significant defect in the tendon and this is a recurrent case. So I'm incising sharply the ankeneus muscle distally. But when I get near the supinator crest of the ulna, I'm careful to use blunt dissection so that I do not damage the insertion of the lateral collateral ligament there. So as soon as I elevate it, uh, about the proximal third, you can now see the pedicle where the blood supply of the muscle is entering. So I will mobilize the muscle carefully, leaving the pedicle intact. And I'm making sure that my muscle can be flipped over adequately to cover the lateral epicondyle. Since the lateral collateral ligament is partly detached here, but it is in good condition, I'm going to put in two anchors and secure both the common extensor origin and the lateral epicondyle back to bone. Now, I will not be putting stitches into the ECRB tendon. That defect is left unsutured. But here I've got some deep stitches going into the lateral collateral and incorporating the common extensor region in the same suture. I'm now uh, suturing that back to the anterior inferior lateral epicondyle right there. putting back the extensor carpi radialis longus back to the fascia, kind of covering that whole area on the lateral aspect to provide as much of a nice healthy muscle padding over the raw area of bone. Now I'm rotating over the ankeneus flap and suturing it to the anterior fascia to lock it into place and thereby providing a nice muscle padding uh, in that area, bring new blood supply and also restore the normal contour of the elbow, which has been damaged by multiple injections and previous failed surgery. And that is just a matter of checking that the flap is viable. In case I've over twisted the muscle, that could be rectified prior to closing the skin. The fascia is closed, except over the muscle, and then skin is closed with a nice subcuticular suture, relining up the spider web on the elbow. This is a patient who's had the ECRB release for tennis elbow and also has radial tunnel syndrome. And you can see I've exposed the supinator and released all the tendinous fibers of the supinator. You can see where the nerve is pinched right here. I don't incise the muscle belly. I only remove all the fibrous septae at the entrance and the exit of the nerve because cutting the muscle belly only creates a hematoma and more scarring around the nerve. The interval I use 
is between the ECRL and the ECRB. Although it's not an easy interval to identify proximally because they're very tendinous here, I start dividing the muscle distally, find the plane and separate the two. This is a better approach to use in a patient with tennis elbow and radial tunnel because it's very close to the ECRB tendon origin and releasing the tendon origin is part of, partly also decompresses the radial nerve or the posterior interosseous nerve. The usual plane, which is between the brachioradialis and the wrist extensors, is far too anterior. And I prefer this approach where you can do the tennis elbow as well as the radial tunnel at the same time. What are the results of surgery? So if you look at uh, this uh, systematic review, most patients after surgery do really well. DASH score increases to 53 from 70, so there's an improvement there. The visual analog pain is decreased significantly. The grip is better, and 92% of people are very happy. And here, Sachin is back and scores 141 after he recovers from his operation. So just when you think surgery is excellent and all this technique and technicalities are very effective, look at this study. This is from Croslack and Morell. So it's a sports medicine doctor and a surgeon from New South Wales in Australia. And they had two groups. They did a sham surgery where they only exposed the ECRL tendon or did the full procedure uh, of debriding the ECRB tendon. And over two and a half years, when they followed these patients, 13 in each group, both groups seem to improve. So in fact, they abandoned the study because they felt that in order to really prove that surgery is effective, they would have to do several hundred more cases and it's just not justifiable to do a sham operation. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, it seems that although surgery works, it seems even making an incision and simply making an incision on the tendon seems to get these patients happy as well. So what do we learn from all these different techniques and from tennis elbow itself? Well, it's a common condition. 40% of us are gonna experience it at some time. Most are self-limiting, 90 to 95% will get better, if not by six months, by 12 months. The other five to 10% will linger on for a couple of years. The key is education, physiotherapy, which includes exercises, splints, and all other modalities and explaining to the patient movements they should avoid, better lifting techniques and different techniques to protect their extensor muscle origin. Now, some people will just not get better. These are the kind of guys who are in repetitive jobs and if they can't change their work or it affects their career, their sports, their work, surgery would be indicated. The good news is surgery generally has good outcomes and again, about 90% of people will be quite happy with the operation. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Uh, so this concludes our uh, session on uh, BOS Master Series, the first session and uh, it was very well attended. I thank everyone who attended physically. I thank everyone who attended on YouTube. Uh, we would also like to uh, give special mention to our convener, Dr. Sanjay Dhar, Dr. Satish Mutha. Besides that, I would like to thank uh, all the unit of uh, DY Patel residents and lecturers who have worked really hard day and night to make this meeting successful. And last but not the least, our academic partners, uh, uh, Torrent Pharmaceuticals, the maker of ShellCal, we would like to really thank them. With this, I, yeah, and thank uh, the audiovisual team here from Ivan and uh, the IT team, Mr. Praveen, who has helped us and has come even on a Sunday morning with us. So I thank everyone. And with this, I invite everyone to join us for lunch who are present physically. The MMC certificates for people who are present physically will be emailed to you on the registered email address which they have registered with. Thank you, everyone. And with this, I close the meeting. Lunch is in the Atchison Medical College building. Legends Cafe.
ये भी किसका तो ये किसका है बोल 